Will Middlebury's annual town meeting please come to order? Can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, let me know if you can't. The legal voters of the town of Middlebury in the county of Addison, the state of Vermont, are hereby warned and notified to meet at the Middlebury Union High School Auditorium at 73 Charles Avenue in Middlebury on Monday, March 2nd, 2020 at 7 p.m. to act on Articles 1 through 7 and to, dis to discuss Articles 8 through 13. And on Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, from 7 a.m. through 7 p.m. at the Recreation Center, 154 Creek Road in Middlebury, to vote by Australian ballot on Articles 8 through 13, as provided by the Middlebury Town Charter. With respect to Articles 8 through 10, legal, the legal voters of the Town of Middlebury are further notified that an informational meeting will be held on Monday, March 2nd, 2020, at 7.30 p.m. at the Middlebury Union High School Auditorium for the purpose of reviewing the proposals for issuing bonds for one, construction of water system improvements in the Court Street, Court Square area, two, construction of flood resiliency improvements for the village of East Middlebury, and three, rehabil rehabilitating the former wastewater treatment facility for use by the police department and energy efficiency upgrades for the police department building. Information on the bond proposals will be presented under Article 7 of the annual town meeting warning. Whew, okay. <laughs> Um, for those of you who are used to town meeting, your old hats at this, but for those of you who are new, all motions, remarks, and questions should be addressed to me, your moderator. I will do my best to recognize everyone in the order that your hands are raised. After I recognize you, please stand up, wait for a microphone, state your name for the record, and speak into the microphone so we can hear you. Who has the microphones right now? See you in the back of the room? There's one there. Just one right now? Is there a second? There will be two. Okay. I ask that we keep our discussion civil in this evening, and I will allow the opportunity for everyone to speak once on an article before granting permission to speak a second time. Action can only be taken on the warned articles before us. So please keep your amendments relevant to the article being discussed, and there is no adding new articles by a motion from the floor. Please raise your hand to be recognized any time you don't understand what is happening or you wish to do something and are unsure on how to proceed. Um, just want to say a quick thanks to MCTV for filming tonight's town meeting, which is being live streamed on their YouTube channel, as well as airing on cable. MCTV has moved to new channels on the upper tier, uh, 1071 and 1091, and they have postcards here at town meeting for more information if you're curious. Are you ready? All right, so Article 1, to act upon the reports of the town officers. What's your pleasure on Article 1? The motion would be to accept the reports of the town officers. Moved. moved by Ann Webster. Is there a second? John Who? Barstow. Uh, John Barstow. Thank you. I will. I'm so nervous. I may have known you for 29 years, but I will not know your name for about 20 minutes into this. So please state your name for the record. <laughs> I'm not Jim Douglas in that category. Okay. So I would like to introduce the select board. There's your chair, Brian Carpenter. If you want to stand up, thank you, Brian. Your vice chair, Heather Seeley. Select board member, Victor Nuovo. Board member, Nick Artem. Board member, Farhad Khan. Member, Lindsay Fuentes George. And Laura Sermley. I'd also like to introduce your town manager, Kathleen Ramsey. She gets her own microphone this evening. Uh, town clerk, Ann Webster, and minute taking tonight is Peggy Connor. Um, 
I'd also like to go um, do some administrative matters. We have a couple people, speaking of Kathleen Ramsey, we have a couple people who are not residents who would like to be um, on the docket for speaking this evening. And I am going to list all their names. Um, there's several town staff plus people who are speaking to the different articles that are being presented. If there is, I'm going to read their names and then I'll ask if there's any objection. Uh, town Manager Kathleen Ramsey, Assistant Town Manager Chris English, Director of Public Works Planning Dan Warner, Director of Public Works Operations Bill Kernan, Library Director Dana Hart, Fire Chief David Shaw, um, from CVOEO uh, Jeanette Guy Carey, uh, from MREMS Ben Fuller and Kate Rothwell, from Turning and from Turning Point, both of those people are residents. So is there any objection to these people speaking this evening? Hearing no objection, we'll move on. Me, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Ben Fuller. Um, Kate Rothwell wasn't able to join us, but Dave Fuller, a resident of Cornwall, was. I checked I Dave, and he is a Middlebury resident. Good, good. Thank you for covering that, but he is covered for the evening. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions? Where, so the, oh, Carrie's the second microphone. We already pointed out the first one. She's got the second one. Thank you. Okay, so hearing no objection, those people can speak. Uh, let's see. So first up, I'd like to invite uh, Select Board Member Laura Sermley to talk to us about other administrative matters. Welcome and good evening, especially to those of you who are watching us at home. Uh, so this is for you, but also for the rest of you who are here tonight. So I'm here to tell you about our website, which is thetownofmiddlebury.org. And this is another way that you can view tonight's presentation and also get all the details on town meeting, including our budget and our report and tonight's presentation. So. You can see you're at the home page here, and if you, if you click on for residents and you scroll down uh, to annual meeting, you would click on annual meeting, and this is for you at home, so you can do this if you're on your laptops and you can catch up with us. Um, and then you'll click on uh, 2020 annual meeting information. And then you'll select um, well when you open that up you'll see that you'll have the option to click on the town annual report there you go so that's how you do it that's how you get to what you're seeing tonight so it's a wonderful resource that you have, and um, we hope that you'll avail yourself of that. And you can see from uh, both the top bar and the, the tabs that this is an incredible resource for finding out about our committees, our staff, and how to contact them. Um, Everything that we get for Select Board, you can view under Select Board Packets. You can see the calendar of upcoming events. You can see from the list here that it's an incredible resource. And our town poll is actually um, an opportunity for you to let us know if you've been using that and how it's going. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. I would like to invite um, Chair Brian Carpenter up to give a welcome and a review of the year. Good evening. The Middlebury Select Board tackled a full slate of issues and projects in 2019, but I want to start off by acknowledging two successfully completed projects that I think truly illustrate the spirit of partnership and shared responsibility that is alive and well in our community. First is the completion of the long-awaited Seymour Street 
Polk Mill Bridge Road Sidewalk, sidewalk Project. A successful, yes. And that was a successful municipal partnership between Middlebury and our neighbors in Weybridge. And the other is the construction of our beautiful new Lions Club picnic pavilion at the Recreation Park. <laughs> we owe much to the businesses, community volunteers, and town staff who gave their time, resources, and expertise to bring these already well-used amenities to life. In addition to these projects, much of the board's focus in the last year continued to be on capital planning and infrastructure improvements designed to meet the future needs of our community while minimizing the impact on taxpayers and water, water utility rate payers. We will be spending much of this evening talking about the critical infrastructure projects that the select board has prioritized for 2020 and the array of funding sources that we are proposing to use and that we hope you will support with your votes. We will discuss these items under Article 6 of the town meeting warning, which will be voted on tonight and in three proposed bond votes under Articles 8 through 10 which will be decided by Australian ballot voting tomorrow at the Recreation Center at 154 Creek Road from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for those of you who have not voted already. Looking ahead to the coming year, in the next few months, the board will be considering the reports and recommendations of the Creek Road Task Force and the Economic Health Committee. Other topics and issues on the horizon later in the year include developing a policy and process regarding the siting of large-scale solar projects, working with the library trustees to revisit the need for rehabilitation, expansion, and or new library facilities, and the town's role in addressing the growing issue of homelessness in our community. Of course, the ongoing construction of the bridge and rail project in the summer closure of Main Street and Merchants Row will be our primary focus in 2020. A public meeting to review the construction timeline and impacts has been scheduled for Tuesday, April 7th at 7 p.m at the Unitarian Universalist Church. A full detailed report on the work of the select board in all of our departments is provided in the town report. In closing, I thank my fellow select board members, Nick Artem, Laura Sermily, Heather Seely, Lindsay Fuentes-George, Farhad Khan, and Victor Nuovo for their hard work insights, and most of all, their unyielding commitment to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'd like to invite um, board member Victor Nuovo for the dedication of the town report. Good evening. The 2020 annual report is dedicated with gratitude to the trustees of the Vittel Trust, Jack Brown and Tony Riffle. Over the past decade, the trust has contributed more than three quarter, quarters of a million dollars to the town conservation fund and has made possible the conservation of 525 acres of land in the town of Middlebury. Uh, Jack and Tony here. At any rate, uh, I extend for the town, um, and I hope for all of you, uh, our thanks. It is also fitting, I think, uh, that we remember with gratitude Joseph Vittel years 1839 to 1915. 
who created the trust over 100 years ago. His zeal as a conservationist has bequeathed to us Chipman Hill, the Patel Wilderness, and a large portion of the Green Mountain National Forest, including Camel's Hump State Park. And he has left us other landmarks, the Battelle Block, the Battelle Bridge, the Morgan Horse Farm, the Breadloaf Inn. I think it is altogether fitting that we remember him with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I'd like to invite uh, board member Farhad Khan, who's going to thank departing board member and staff. Hi, everyone. Laura is leaving the select board after serving for the past six years. During her time on this board, Laura was active on the town energy committee and chaired and continues to serve on the town public health and safety committee. Laura was also the town representative on the Addison County Transit Resources Actor Board and served as the alternate delegate on the Addison County Solid Waste Management District Board. Laura is committed to her pursuit for a cleaner environment and making the town a safer place for bikers and walkers and a friendlier environment for everyone. Thank you, Laura, for all that you do and you did for the citizens of the Middlebury, the town of Middlebury. Laura, it has been a pleasure and an honor to serve with you on the select board. Last three years, you have been a positive influence on me. You will be greatly missed. With this, I would like to invite Laura to present a resolution recognizing her service to the town of Middlebury. I really am honored to have served Middlebury. I'm, I'm known for um, the signs that you see on walk and roll days that say slowing down for a safer town. Um, so slowing down is very hard for me. <laughs> those signs are for me. No, those signs are for all of us really because I think that it's important for us to do that and to give others a chance to have this service. So I look forward to, um, to others having this important experience. And thank you for giving it to me. I appreciate it. I also have an acknowledgment for Officer Scott Fisher. Is he here today or he's not? OK. so. Here you go. Scott retired in March of 2019 after being on the Middlebury Police Department as a part-time special officer for one year and as a full-time patrol officer for the past 32 years. Scott developed and led the Law Enforcement Explorer Program for area youth for 25 years. He also developed the School Resource Officer Program in, in the Middlebury schools and served in that position for many years, and he developed the department's deadly force and firearms training program that has helped prepare officers for deadly force engagement and in the judicious use of force. Thank you, Scott, for your dedication to the Millbury community. Thank you, Farhad. I'd like to invite um, Super, uh, Parks and Recreation Superintendent Dustin Hunt and Scott Bourne to present the Robert Collins Award. Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Bourne, and I am the program coordinator for Parks and Recreation, and this is Superintendent Dustin Hunt, and Together, we are your pro, uh, Parks and Recreation Department. <clears throat> and this, this award that we're going to give tonight, uh, the Robert E. Collins Award, 
uh, is a very special award for us because it really honors the people who have dedicated their time, countless time and effort to make our department better. And tonight we are going to be honoring Karen and Todd Duguay, uh, who have been a part of our department for the last couple years uh, and have shown just extraordinary and tireless efforts in making our department better. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I think it's best to uh, quote Dustin, who in our, our activity guide um, put together, I think really what says it all. Todd and Karen Duguay volunteered hundreds of hours completing the coaching hat trick, soccer, basketball, baseball, of which Todd organizes. They are both incredible role models and have made positive impacts on hundreds of children within our programs. We cannot run our programs without volunteers who coach, who assist and coach, who fill in at the last minute to ref or be an umpire. It is a, it's an incredible responsibility that we don't take lightly. Uh, and if you've ever coached, if you've ever been through a season coaching, it pretty much takes everything that you have and stuff that, things that you didn't even know that you had uh, to get to the other side of it. So it is a very important thing uh, for us to, uh, to uh, offer this award. One, uh, one autumn afternoon, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I saw Todd out on the, uh, the soccer field being Todd. If you've ever seen Todd coach, it's extraordinary. He is a whirlwind out there. And Karen was on the sidelines, and I said, I walked up to her and I said, how is he here at 3.15 every day getting ready to coach? And she says to me, well, he gets up at 3.30 in the morning to go to work to make sure he's here by 3 o'clock. And I just said, oh, okay, there's a Robert Collins Award nominee right there. And we're, and we're, very, we're just thrilled to have them a part of the department. The first uh, Collins Award was presented in 1974 and all the subsequent recipients have their names on the plaques in the rec gym's entryway. The names read like a who's who in Middlebury for the last 45 years, and Dustin and I are thrilled to add Karen and Todd to that list. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2020 Robert E. Collins Awards winners, if you want to call it that, or recipients, <laughs> Todd and Karen Duguay. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any questions or discussions on Article 1, which is to act upon the reports of the town officers? Hearing none, the motion is to accept the reports of the town officers. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it, and Article 1 is adopted. Article 2, shall the voters of the Town of Middlebury authorize the select board pursuant to 24 VSA 1786 AB to replace two police cruisers and related equipment and to finance the purchase of same by borrowing funds in a total amount not to exceed $80,000 over a term not to exceed five years. What's your pleasure regarding Article 2? Heather Seely moves. Is there a second? Farhad Khan. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Select Board Member Nick Artem. He's already invited up to the microphone. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Susan. Welcome to the new role. Thank you. Um, just before I start this, you heard a few minutes ago Brian you know, thanked six of us for being on this board, but there's one name he didn't mention. That was himself. Um, the, the other six of us are incredibly appreciative to the leadership and dedication that Brian gives um, to us at every meeting, and the time he spends is, is just phenomenal. Uh, well, we, what you also may not often know is that there's, besides being seven select board colleagues, we're seven friends, and that leads to a high degree of civility among our discussion. And, um, 
Brian's a big factor in why that happened. So thanks, Brian. <laughs> Okay, our Article 2, now we're going to talk about police cars. Article 2 is um, to authorize the select board to borrow up to $80,000 for the purchase of two police cruisers. It's about reliability. Um, the police operate 24-7. These vehicles have to be constantly ready to go at a, a moment's notice and be dependable to respond to whatever emergency comes about. So the, the concept is that we cycle out the two oldest high-maintenance cars for a trade-in against the purchase of two new cruisers. Um, the estimated cost for replacing these cruisers and the equipment that goes within them is $40,000 each. And this is based on recent pricing. Uh, we recently purchased one car, and um, it was in, in that range, actually a little bit less, but uh, uh, it was in the $40,000 range. Now, we've actually had for a number of years this program of a regular cruiser replacement, and it's a regular schedule of 2 one two. Uh, two cars are replaced in odd calendar years, and then one in the even. Um, and so uh, this past year was a one-year um, purchase. Now, we've had this schedule for about 15 years, and I can say it's been very, very successful. Um, the reliability has been there. We've been getting good value for money for the cars. Um, we're seeing lower maintenance costs. You know, as the vehicles get older, you get wear parts, and it starts to become uh, more expensive to keep them. And... <coughs> They're less stressed when they're newer. They're operating within their design limits. Um, they maintain a high level of reliability. And we tend to get higher trade-in values. If we were to hold on to these cars for an excessive long term, we might get $400 to $2,400. We're seeing trade-in values in the five dollars to $7,000, which then gets put back into the cost of the new car. And so it's been, again, good value. But you know, sort of a life cycle of these cars over time the first two years, they typically accumulate about 70 to 80,000 miles a year. Compare that to your own car, it's a lot of driving these vehicles are doing, but again, they're running 24-7. They're constantly out on the street. Uh, they also can't ever get cold. You have high sensitivity electronics. The cars have to be ready to go immediately. So in some cases, the, especially during the cold winter months, they're running longer, and that puts a wear on the, uh, the drivetrain. Again, we need to keep them ice free because they have to be ready to go. Um, the other factor that enters into it is unlike one's own personal vehicle where you tend to be one or two drivers, these cars are driven by three to four uh, officers in a day, so they get a lot of different driving uh, characteristics. In the third year of these vehicles, we move them over to a, a point, point where they are often maybe a reserve or use, uses a third necessary vehicle and you know we, they they approach ninety to one hundred thousand miles in, in some cases uh, for that year. Uh, as noted in year four, it becomes the concept of war weary. War weary. These, these cars have been used very heavily. We're starting to see at that point uh, failure and wear on, on suspension parts and drivetrain parts, and that's when they start to become expensive to take care of. And again, the reliability drops off. Frontline service for about four years. After that, we'll move them to secondary roles where they don't need to necessarily be ready to respond quickly, such as the resource officer for the schools or the canine unit. Uh, there can be a little bit longer re response for those. <clears throat> it also, with this cycling uh, arrangement, um, it, it also uh, puts into the investigator's car on an eight-year cycle, and then the car that's used for the chief is 10 years. Now, those cars could be pulled into patrol service for an extra special event if we need to, but they're not the, the front line, so we tend to hold on to those longer because they're not seeing the wear. Um, a little note here. Uh, some of the questions that do come out, uh, and when we hear frequently, is, well, what about hybrid cars? You know, because one of the things we are ser seriously in tune with, as we know all of you um, have requested and, and are, is reduce our impact on the global warming issue and the use of the fossil fuels. Uh, we actually are proud to say that this year, w with the one-year purchase, or one-car purchase, we did decide to try a hybrid. Um, they finally were available. Uh, for a long time, we just didn't have one available. But um, the Ford Explorer, which we have had great success with in the standard version, came out with a police package with a hybrid. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a little more expensive 
But then when we looked at the manufacturer's data and Chief Hanley and the police officers had done a very good job of checking with departments that had acquired these vehicles, we find that there should pay off um, that extra money in a short term uh, within, say, two years in using less fuel. And then after that, it's a consistent less fuel. They are new vehicles. They have good warranties from the manufacturer, has a lot of experience with it. But our police officers are going to be closely watching how these vehicles perform. And our intention is to purchase more of them in the future. So we'll, it's a wait-see. Um, there's also been questions about electric cars, and we just they're just not out there yet. Uh, and plus, the fact is they have to always be ready to go. So if we have a long charging period, that impacts the reliability. Um, so what, again, we're asking for is authorization of 80000 to purchase two vehicles this year. Any questions? In the back. Hi, Dave Silverman. Um, so, you know, like every year we get asked to buy more police cruisers. Um, why aren't we just putting this into the budget then? Because it's not a one-off, it's every year. Um, good question, actually. Do we have... <laughs> because it's a fair question, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, David, we are looking ahead to doing that. We are proposing that with the highway uh, department equipment this year, uh, which I will go over in depth. Uh, didn't have time to uh, do a deep dive with the police equipment this year, but I think you can expect that next year. Ken? Thank you. I'm John Barstow. Just curious, will either of these two new cruisers be hybrids? Well, again, based on the, um, what we saw this past year for, for bids that came in with them, it became very favorable. Uh, we're going to obviously be closely watching because we're not purchasing them immediately. There will be a little bit of field time to see how they are. But I think the expectation is we're going to look at them very closely as, as an option. As they, everything so far seems to be quite good on it, but we haven't received the vehicles. Have we, Chief? We haven't received. No, we haven't, don't have it yet. Um, but uh, New York City was one of the departments that ordered a lot of these vehicles, so they're already getting a lot of use, and it's been favorable. Um, but I would expect, just as a general thought, John, is that as we go forward with vehicle purchases, you know, fuel efficiency is, is high on the list, as long with reliability. So if this is the way to go, yeah. Any other questions? Any discussion? Are you ready for the question? Okay, so the motion is on adopting Article 2 as warned. All in favor of adopting Article 2, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. The ayes have it, and Article 2 is adopted. Moving on to Article 3. Shall the voters of the Town of Middlebury vote to adopt the proposed budget for the fiscal year 2021 July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, in the amount of $11,503,000, uh, oh, sorry, $11,503,680, with a portion thereof in the amount of $7,498,204 to be raised by taxes and 583745 to be allocated from the annual local option tax receipts in excess of debt and maintenance requirements of the Cross Street Bridge to offset spending for capital improvements. So Who said that? John Barstow, is there a second? Seconded by Farhad Khan, thank you. I'd like to invite Town Manager Kathleen Ramsey to talk. Good evening. Um, spoiler alert, um, usually we save the big reveal to the end of the presentation, um, but our first slide is <laughs> what the impact of the budget uh, will be. We're looking at, uh, with the budget under consideration this evening, six, about six-tenths of a cent of an increase from uh, 0.8026 to 0.8088. So the bulk of your um, revenue comes from property taxes at 65%, payments and gifts from the college at about 11%, local option tax about 9%, state and federal 
revenue at $387,000. Other, which is quite large at 4%, but the intermunicipal transfers and interest uh, tag didn't fit there with the large font, so I put that as other. And fees for service at $500,000, or about 4%. What does this revenue pay for? We have about $3.5 million in public works. That is all told with the operating capital and employee benefits for that department. Police department at about 2.4 million. Fire department, 333 million, 333,000. Libraries, 890,000, parks and recreation, just under 700,000, administration and community programs at 1.5 million, or about 13%. It's important to note that that administration figure also includes the administration that we do for the water and wastewater departments, which is reimbursed through a intermunicipal inter, interfund transfer. Our major drivers this year are employee benefits and wages, up about $194,000. Our total wages and benefits are $5 million, $3.5 million in wages, $1.5 million in benefits. As mentioned earlier, we have a proposal to increase uh, the budget for equipment fund replacement for, DP, uh, for the DPW, $239,000, and to increase uh, the local option tax going for um, retained for capital improvements by $175,000. This will be offset by a decrease in debt service of $98,000, uh, a revenue increase of $183,000 from retained local option tax revenue, an increased use of the fund balance, $50,000, and an increased use of the fund balance uh, to pay for the equipment fund. Uh, replacement increase for the DPW. In developing the budget, we asked for and considered um, all of your public input. During public hearings on the local option tax, cross street bridge fund surplus in the fall, and the FY21 budget, and on social media, and from your letters and emails, Citizens asked the board to use cash on hand to minimize increases in the tax rate, use reserves and or local option tax revenue to fund infrastructure improvement projects, and reduce amount borrowed and or interest expense. We put those items in that input into action in the budget by applying an additional $50,000 of unassigned fund balance, previous year's surplus funds, to stabilize the tax rate, $200,000 to, to be applied this year, up from $150,000 in previous years. We've also proposed increasing the amount of the local option tax, cross street bridge fund balance dedicated to capital improvements and time-sensitive community projects increased from $400,000 in FY20 to $583,745 this year. Using the local option tax cross street bridge fund balance to defray interest expense for debt incurred for the flood resiliency and PD adaptive reuse project. And finally, applying $192,000 $462 of unassigned fund balance, previous year's surplus funds to capitalize the DPW equipment fund. So I'm going to take a, a more in-depth look 
at uh, the local option tax and the uh, equipment fund next. The local option tax, Cross Street Bridge Fund for capital improvements. Noting the ongoing need for water, wastewater, highway, and stormwater infrastructure projects, and recognizing the burden that funding these projects will place on ta taxpayers and utility ratepayers, the Select Board worked to formulate an integrated, sustainable, long-term plan to finance infrastructure improvements. The strategy, while still being developed, includes using the local option tax receipts in excess of those needed in the Cross Street Bridge Fund for debt service and maintenance to offset infrastructure improvement expenses, including important community projects and debt service on larger projects. So this chart, this graph shows you uh, what we're anticipating for revenue for the Cross Street Bridge Fund. We have $600,000 as a gift from the college towards that uh, each year. And we're estimating $1 million for receipts in local option tax that we received just over $1 million in 2019. So we believe that that's a solid estimate. So those revenues of 1.6 million, the 600 from the college, the 1, 1 million from the local option tax, exceeds our debt service expense, which is $966,296 for FY21 by $634,000 a year. So that's an annual surplus. So this slide breaks down the $966,296 which is needed. $600,000 of that is covered by the college gift and local option tax covering the remaining $366,296. So this is the local option tax revenue estimated at $1 million. Dedicated for Cross Street Bridge Fund debt service is $366, $296, leaving us a local option tax uh, surplus, if you will, above debt service of $633,704. What we're proposing to do with that $633,000 is to offset $400,000 of capital improvements. That's the same amount we did last year. To pay for the remaining um, match we need for the passenger rail platform parking at $57,040 to pay our share of the downtown sidewalks and curbs to complete the downtown uh, after the railroad bridge project uh, is done, to pay the first year debt service on the PD use, reuse project, and our plan is to pay e the debt service each year for seven years on the, um, the PD reuse project and the same thing for the flood resiliency project with the first year interest payment being $9,891. Leaving us uh, $49,000, just under $50,000 to transfer to the Cross Street Bridge Fund um, this year. Some of the capital improvements that will be covered uh, this year, our replacement of the Katy Road culvert, Colonial Drive water, wastewater, stormwater, and road replacements, Maple Street stormwater improvements, and library replacement heating system design. During the Select Board's uh, strategic retreat uh, last June, they asked uh, staff to um, include in the budget phasing in increased funding for paved roads and sidewalks, and those items are both included in the capital budget before you. 
uh, paved roads increasing $44,480 a year, compounding annually each year for five years, and an increase in sidewalk maintenance of 21300 again, compounding annually each year for five years. A little more detail on the rail platform parking. This is for construction of the parking lot and lighting associated with the new Vermont Agency of Transportation's rail platform on Middle Seymour Street. Um, the request for that is $57,040 this year. And the downtown improvements, lighting, park fixtures, historical wayfinding, signage, and sidewalk improvements outside of the bridge and rail project scope, $100,000. We've also applied for grant funding for both of those projects. The rail platform, we were successful uh, in last year's grand round, grant round. And this year, we will be applying with, with grant applications due on March 9th for the downtown improvements. We'll also be allocating a portion of the local option tax excess toward the East Middlebury Flood Resiliency Project debt service and the debt service on the storage facilities at the old wastewater treatment facility for the PD adaptive use project. Using the local option tax revenue to offset bond payments for the flood resiliency and PD reuse projects eliminates the need to increase the tax rate to service debt on these two important projects. Additionally, the board opted for a shorter borrowing term than usual, seven years versus the customary 20 years, saving tens of thousands of dollars in interest expense. This slide shows the breakdown of our capital improvement budget with the lion's share going to public works uh, projects, uh, 1.1 million, um, small portion to the police department, fire department, libraries, parks and recreation, uh, and general government. And people are always interested in the uh, Cross Street Bridge Fund uh, surplus, which is standing at $2.5 million as of the end of last year. Finally, we are proposing to use some of our unassigned fund balance, uh, previous year's uh, surplus, to boost funding for public works vehicles and replacement. The total Average annual cost of replacement for public works vehicles and equipment is $380,000 compared to the $130,000 currently budget, budgeted for replacement of public works vehicles and equipment in the general fund. The DPW vehicle and equipment replacement plan has been vetted and refined by the infrastructure committee and is available on the town's website. To address the shortfall, the difference between the $380,000 needed and the $130,000 budgeted, and make the public works vehicle and equipment replacement plan more sustainable, the select board developed a plan for phasing in additional funding for the equipment replacement program by increasing an, an additional $47,000 each year for five years, starting in FY21, a compounding increase each year. In order to fund DPW equipment purchases this year, rather than borrowing, the board has proposed using $192,462 from the town's general fund balance, combined with equipment fund reserves for the purchase of a vacuum-assisted street sweeper and a medium-duty Class 6 dump truck. Initially, we had proposed the compounding increase of $47,000 to get us to the $380,000, $400,000 funding level. 
not taking into account that we needed to purchase equipment immediately during the phase-in period for the increased funding. This slide shows what borrowing would look like if we phased in the $47,000 a year for the next five years. We would still have a long tail of borrowing left. If we begin to capitalize the equipment fund with this transfer from the fund balance, you see that for DPW borrowing, our, we'll be paid off our equipment uh, in the next two years. This slide shows the use of the fund balance in the lower, looks like a blue line, uh, the darker line trending down. We're proposing a five-year plan for using the fund balance uh, to capitalize the equipment fund, uh, 192000 this year, $141,000 next year, $50,000, $40,000, $20,000. In, 20, in FY24. Uh, and this would give us time to uh, increase uh, the budget by $47,000 a year. Uh, finally, each year the select board um, interviews uh, several agencies. Um, this year it interviewed uh, End of Life Services, the Middlebury Area Land Trust, and the Better Middlebury Partnership. First, End of Life Services. In partnership with the community, End of Life Services supports patients, families, friends, and caregivers before, during, and after the dying process. End of Life Services advocates for compassionate end of life care by providing volunteers, bereavement support, music, and other therapeutic practices education for the community, training for providers, and options for those who are unable to complete their lives in their own home. End of Life Services requested an increase in its current appropriation from 2000 in FY20 to 3000 in FY21. This increase is included in the FY21 budget. The Middlebury Area Land Trust, MALT, works with the community to conserve natural, productive landscapes and to enhance scenic recreation and educational opportunities. MALT and its members provide trail maintenance for the trail around Middlebury, the much-loved TAM, land conservation efforts, public access projects, and environmental education. MALT requested an increase in its current appropriation from 5400 in the current fiscal year to $7,000 in the coming fiscal year. This increase is included in the FY21 budget. The Middlebury Partnership, BMP, is a civic organization dedicated to helping shape Middlebury's future as the economic and cultural heart of our region by forming connections, creating opportunities, and building community. BMP advocates for economic growth and sustainability, hosts events including Spectacular, Very Merry Middlebury, and the Downtown Block Party, and promotes and works to promote Middlebury to a broader audience, including spearheading regional marketing activities and operating the Middlebury Money Program. BMP receives an annual appropriation of $25,000 from the general fund and $15,166 from the Downtown Improvement District budget and tax. The BMP did not request an increase this year, but has indicated that it may request an increase next year. Looking ahead, while the select board has presented a budget requiring only a modest increase in the property tax rate again this year, Keep in mind that increases in the following expenses, capital improvements, replacement of vehicles and equipment, health insurance, mandates including uh, clean water uh, mandates, and uncertainty in, on the future of state and federal funding will put significant upward pressure on the budgets in FY22 and beyond. 
Happy to answer any questions you have. Our department heads are also available to answer questions about the budget, public works, parks and recreation, director of public works operations, Bill Kernan, and parks and recreation superintendent, Dustin Hunt. Capital improvements, public works planning director, Dan Werner, public safety, police chief, Tom Hanley, and fire chief, David Shaw. Libraries, Library Director Dana Hart, and General Government and Revenues, me. Other questions for Kathleen in the back? Wait, wait, wait for a microphone and then state your name, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan McGarry and I live on Rogers Road. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a chance that everybody might be delightfully surprised once we do our homesteading or things this um, spring, my house went up almost $100,000 in this assessment recently. And there's um, only a $100,000 increase in the expected taxes from the community. And I wonder if we might be in for a big surprise once we do all those, you know, family, um, you know, income things we do for the state in April, that we actually might have a much bigger tax revenue um, than anticipated. Did you want to? Was there a question there? Yeah. <laughs> was it just a statement or is there a question? Is anyone else imagining, especially our leadership, that there might actually be excess taxes coming our way because of the recent assessment that all of our property underwent with the um, assessors at the state level? Thank you. So we take the amount uh, to be raised and divide it by the property value. So we're not raising any more than we need. We just adjust the uh, property tax rate accordingly. So it's the same pie, just divide it up differently. Other questions? There looks like one right here. And then I'll get to you in the back in a minute. How much of... Uh, Wait, state your name, please. Roger Desotel. Thank you. Uh, how much is health insurance for the town employees in the budget, either as a total amount or as a percentage? So the total amount is about $600,000. In the back? Uh, Thomas Williams, <clears throat> there was a meeting about the uh, platform for the rail, railroad station. <clears throat> Some of us went to that and we were quite concerned about the way the parking was laid out, front end in type of parking. So I'm wondering if that was transmitted to you all at the top management. Um, it seems to us that parallel parking to drop off people at the train station is all that we should have there. We're very concerned about the S-turn that goes from Maple Street into the Marble Works, and there doesn't seem to be any plan for sidewalk from the train platform to the Marble Works. Has, has either of those two things changed? Well, we're discussing Article 3 I'm assuming town staff could get back to you? Briefly, those uh, items were conveyed to our engineer. We don't have funding for a sidewalk right now, but certainly that will be high on our list uh, for an extension in that area. Any other questions or discussion? In the back over here? Hi, George Tucker. Um, do we currently have a street sweeper? I noticed there was a need for one in the budget. We do have a street sweeper. Correct me if I'm wrong, like 20 years old, 30 years old? I, I, 30 years old? 25. 25. There you go. Any other questions here in the front?
Uh, Jason Duquette Hoffman, I was um, looking at the public safety budget and I noticed that we're budgeting um, around $105,000 for uh, shift replacement overtime, um, among other overtime charges. And I'm wondering uh, if, there's, if there's anticipated that we'll be funding overtime or staffing in that pattern going forward or uh, whether that reflects um, some anticipation of a, you know, a hiring process that may take some extra time. Um, and if that is our staffing pattern, wondering about the impacts on our officers of working that kind of overtime and if there are any risks associated with uh, increase in accidents or other health and safety issues for our officers, if that's a staffing pattern going forward. Yeah, that's a concern. We, we budget for a normal year. So we know how many shifts are going to be vacated. We have to staff 24-7. So when somebody disappears on vacation or whatever, uh, we may have to replace that person with overtime. So we budget for a normal year. In the past year and a half, two years, and going forward to this year, um, we've had three officers out of work with some serious injuries. I don't anticipate them back, so we're running three people short. I've got a vacancy that's being replaced in the academy. Uh, we're careful about how we manage over time and how we stretch our staff. They've got to have eight hours between any 16-hour shift if they work a 16-hour shift. We don't let them work more than that. Uh, it is wearing on them, for sure, and uh, it's not something we like, but we have no choice. We've got to cover 24-7, and we will do it. Uh, so we budget that as much as we can. Financially, it, it, you look at the figures, and the figures are way out of whack, but when we have somebody out of work being paid by workers' comp, that offsets the overtime cost. So it's kind of a jumbling of figures that we have to do to do this. And like you, I am concerned about the toll it takes working too many hours. Uh, we really don't have a choice. They, they will generally work 16 hours on, eight off, try to give them their days off. We try to give them their vacation time. Of course, that causes more vacancies when we do that. So it's a jumbling act. Uh, we keep an eye on it. We man try to manage it so that it doesn't get too excessive so it creates any issues. Of course, things compound. When a guy works too many hours, he gets fatigued. He's more likely to get sick, more likely to get the flu, and that further compounds things. So. And that's our chief of police, Tom Hanley. There's another question over here in the corner. Andrea Galliano. I don't know if I'm the only resident that is absolutely incensed by the fact that our police department has to go through this. And I'm wondering if in this budget there is money that we could use to find a way, some short-term solutions. Can we contract with the sheriff to do our transports? Can we contract with the state police to do some overnights temporarily? Can we get Officer Fisher back out of retirement short term <laughs> to be a community resource officer for some of the social problems we're facing? I just, I, I don't understand why our police department isn't a priority. They really should be, and we should be tripping over ourselves to help them get through this. It seems very unreasonable to me that they have gone through this through no fault of their own. Injury happens, and, and that we're not trying to scramble to find a way to help them get through that. Where is their money in this budget that we can divert to them? So annually, Tom lets the select board, um, prepares a very comprehensive and complete budget, and asks the select board um, lets the select board know what he needs for staffing, and the select board has responded um, by providing full funding for that. I know Tom is always on the lookout for strategies to relieve the stress on his officers. It takes a little over a year to replace one person when they leave. That's just the way it goes. Um, I can get into the details, but it's, it's a long process to hire a police officer. They're in training for 32 weeks. There's another four months of a screening process polygraphs, background investigations before we let them in the door. So when somebody leaves, their replacement then is subject to the whims of the police academy if they can get them into the academy, which only runs two courses a year. 
So we have to time our hiring to coincide with the police academy. So that's another thing that exacerbates when we lose a person. The injuries are unforeseen. I mean, we know people are going to get hurt in this job. There's some violence involved. Uh, generally, we don't have three people all hurt at once. So it's been a bit extraordinary for the past two years. Uh, eventually, we'll get over that and get back to normal. Um, all police agencies are having the same issue that we are. Um, the state police, by law, cannot contract with the town for police service. So we can't count on that. I know, but I don't know when that statute wait, wait, is not wait. that old. If you're going to have a discussion, we need a microphone over there, please. She said Brandon did. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But they can't, they can't do that anymore unless there's some, there's some reason she can't, but she can't get into a contract with a community. Thanks, Tom. There's a question in the back. You may want to stay there, Tom. <laughs> Just saying. So on this, Dave Silverman, uh, on the same topic, so I mean, I think we, we really do prioritize the police in the budget. I mean, it's more than 20% of the budget. It's the biggest piece of the budget, and it's not even all of it, right? Because we also have cruisers on a bond, and we have another 850000 with 50000 a year going to pay that bond for a salt shed to park the cars. So I mean, we, we do prioritize the police a lot. Um, I think that I would love to see our select board be thinking a little more broadly about public safety and relieving the stress we put on the police department by making sure that we are addressing our community issues with the right tool. Often the police are sent in to respond to crises that are better handled by social service workers. And we ask the police to do the wrong job and that's not right for the officers. And it's not right for the people who are in crisis being responded to with a show of force, which is not helpful. So I really urge the select board to be thinking more broadly about public safety and the way we use our dollars, our, our very hard earned tax dollars, to provide safety in this community in a more holistic way. Thank you, Tom, for your service. I don't have a question for you, though. <laughs> Just so you know, we've long worked with the counseling service to get an embedded clinician with the department to go with us to the kind of calls that David has talked about, and we've gotten no support from the state. It's a program that works well in Chittenden County, but Addison is the forgotten county. We don't get a lot of stuff, so uh, that's something we've been working on. We've recently partnered up with the Turning Point Center for people with alcohol issues to have one of those people work with the homeless population with us to help them with those kind of issues. So we are doing some of that, David. It's just a matter of getting that started and getting support from the state. Well, we haven't, <laughs> haven't forgotten about it. I sound like a broken record to some of them. Jason in the front again. Is it, wait, wait, Jason, you spoke before. So hang on a second. Is there anybody else who hasn't spoken yet would like to speak? Go ahead. Um, in your estimation, are the hours that you anticipate needing to pay overtime for, our, or is there a percentage of those that uh, might be better served by um, other social services that you could contract with with those monies instead of putting officers on overtime? No, the first response work they're doing, and sometimes we get down to bare bones that we're strictly first response to emergencies, they have to be done by a police officer. The, the adjunct, the ad things like a social service person going to certain social situations that aren't, they're still gonna require the police to deal with at some point like that. So that won't mitigate overtime hours. Okay, any other questions on Article 3? Up here in the front. <laughs> My name is Brockton Corbett. Um, First, can you just define uh, PD for me? What does PD stand for? Police Department. Okay. Police Department. And when you say eight cents, does that mean for every dollar? Is it uh, what, per what? Our tax rate? Yeah. It's um, per hundred dollars value. Okay. And just a third question. Um, yeah. How, how many uh, town employees are there? There's 55 full time. And that's across all of our departments. 
Okay. You ready for the question on Article 3? Okay, so the motion is on, on adopting Article 3 as warned. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, Article 3 is adopted. Moving on to Article 4. Shall the Town of Middlebury vote to increase its appropriation for Middlebury Regional Emergency and Medical Services, MREMS, by 63720 from $21,240 to $84,960 to support MREM's mission to provide quality emergency medical services, including paramedic and heavy rescue service, emergency dispatch, and answering medical education and community outreach. What's your pleasure regarding Article 4? Is it Natalie Peters? Is there a second? Thank you, Heather. Heather Seely seconds. And I'm inviting, who am I inviting? Hang on. Jeff Carpenter, David Fuller, Ben Fuller, and Kate could not come is what you said? That's correct. She's at another, another town's town meeting tonight. Okay. So I'm Ben Fuller. I'm a resident of Salisbury, uh, and I serve on the board of MREMS. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the organization tonight. I'm joined by Dave Fuller. He's a member of the organization. Um, very brief overview. MREMS provides emergency response, paramedic service, heavy rescue service, emergency dispatch and answering. We do transports, interagency transports. They do medical education and community outreach for the 10 towns of Addison County. Um, which is roughly 17,000 residents as of the last census. We'll see how that changes in the next year. Uh, MREMS is a nonprofit. We're not associated with any of the towns, um, nor are we associated with the college, with the hospital, um, or the town of Middlebury. That said, we do rely on support from the member towns. This year, we're requesting a significant increase from all the member towns, an increase from $2.50 per capita to $10 per cap. The reason for the increase um, is not that we're in a poor financial position, um, but we don't have the resources to establish and maintain an ongoing equipment replacement fund. Um, I think those of you who are long-term residents of the town probably know better than I, um, but it seems like every few years there's a capital campaign from MRENS. We need a new ambulance. We need support. So we're going out to, frankly, the members of the community and the philanthropists in the community asking for help with that. Um, we don't think that that's a sustainable model. And so we're asking for an increase from each of the member towns so that we can fund and establish an ongoing equipment replacement fund. It is a large increase and it's overdue. That said, it is not out of step with what the rest of the rescue services across the state command from the towns that they serve. The statewide average is actually slightly over $26 per capita. There are communities where they're commanding $60 per capita. Um, we're in a good position where we don't need to ask for that much, but we do need to ask for this increase. So I noted that the current revenue streams do meet our operating expenses, and they do. Um, but there's not enough left over to establish a meaningful equipment replacement fund. And we need to effectively be replacing vehicles every two years. We have a fleet of four ambulances, and we'd like to get to the point where we're replacing each ambulance after an eight-year cycle. Um, currently, uh, we're running a 12-year-old vehicle and an 18-year-old vehicle. Um, 
the equipment needs to be updated much more frequently than that. And when you're running vehicles that old, the wear and tear adds up, and so you're spending more on maintenance than you really should be. There's also not a whole lot of resale value when you go to sell an ambulance at 200,000 miles. So you can see, if you move to the next slide, we have laid out what will get us to an every other year replacement cycle for one of the vehicles. We currently have $42,000 set aside for equipment replacement. If we get the appropriations from all the towns, that will add roughly $160,000 to our operating budget. A new ambulance, fully loaded, costs about $250,000. So it's going to get us really close, not all the way there, but close enough so that we can manage to order one this year. That said, when you order an ambulance, it doesn't show up the next month. <laughs> it's typically a, about a 12-month wait on the order of it. Um, with the appropriations, though, we will be able to get ourselves to a point where we're replacing those vehicles on a more frequent basis. Uh, and if you move to the next slide, you'll see that um, in 2028, we would be on that schedule. Um, then, once we have four trucks that are much more equal and reliable, we'll be able to distribute the mileage across them. Um, it's also going to mean that as we replace these vehicles, we're getting the most up-to-date equipment in them. Things like power lift cots that reduce injury for your rescue workers and are actually now a mandate. We've had to retrofit into some of the older vehicles that didn't come with it. Um, I will note that... Uh, of the 10 county towns, seven have put us right into the budget. It's not a vote as a line item. Three have listed it as a line item, Middlebury being one of them. Uh, and the other two, well, Kate's at one of them, and another board member's at another one of those towns. Um, we're optimistic that you all will support us in our mission. Um, it's critical to the health and safety and well-being of the communities. Uh, and while I'm reluctant to do so, I will open it up to questions at this point. Are there any questions for these guys? Over here? Looks like Ken Prime. I'm starting to remember names. <laughs> Ken Prime. <clears throat> For anybody who has served on or been served by MREMS, um, I think there's no question about the level of care um, and professionalism that the staff provides. Um, and the role that MREMS plays in the continuum of care in our community. That said, um, I this is a large increase in um, a contribution to a nonprofit. And I understand there's a protocol that Middlebury has used in the past to vet requests from nonprofits. And I think uh, <clears throat> Manager Ramsey talked about that earlier when three of the uh, nonprofits that we support through our budget were interviewed this year. And so I would ask the select board, <clears throat> has there been an interview process? Have their questions been answered um, to the extent that other nonprofits' questions have been answered? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody's got to <an> answer. <laughs> you asked for the select board? Here it is. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess that's me, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a good question. And uh, can I, I've been out the last couple of weeks. We've had a couple of things in the family. Uh, I would say we did not follow our normal process. And we met with MREMS and had some questions. 
Um, we are very concerned about the significant increase in funding and feel that, that uh, the, when, for us to look at giving this much to a, to a nonprofit, we ought to have full oversight of the utilization of those funds. Uh, I did hear a plan for the replacement of the vehicles, and I just did some simple math, and it's overfunded now. So, um, you know, I'm a little concerned. I'll admit that. Uh, but I uh, can't speak for the entire select board, but I've heard from a number of them that uh, we would like to uh, vet it through our full process. So that's kind of where the board sets at this time. Any other questions over here? Oh, wait, down in the front here. Victoria first. Sorry, I'll come back to you in a minute. So close. <laughs> Victoria DeWind. Um, I guess I wanted to make it clear um, your request is um, would be ongoing, not just for this coming year? That is correct. Okay. Well, given that the select board hasn't had the opportunity to fully vet this and that they have concerns, um, I appreciate the um, that amount of money um, from taxpayers um, not without uh, monitoring. Uh, perhaps this could be made into a one-year request and then reviewed after the select board does a, a more thorough um, consideration so that um, it isn't permanent in our budget uh, as of yet. Is that a motion or is that just a statement? Um, <laughs> I guess I'll make it a motion. <laughs> okay. Is there a second to that motion to make it a one-year? Hang on a second. Max Krauss, thank you. I'm just thinking about where that goes. So it would be to make this article a one-year request. Is there discussion on the amendment now, not on the main motion? Yes. Yeah, this is Dan Brown. I just have a question for the select board. Brian, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Is, uh, are, are you interested in vetting this issue right now before we approve this for this year? But it looks like the motion that's on out on the floor right now is to approve it for this year and then vet it for next year. What is the select board's desire? Is that, is that to, to not have this approved now and, and vet it some more and look at it later on this year? And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but. Little select board huddle. <laughs> Heather Seely. Uh, so this request, um, didn't come to us as quickly as we might have hoped to have a uh, good discussion within the select board, uh, but we didn't want to prevent the discussion at town meeting. So we thought that the best way to solve that at the time was to give the voters of Middlebury the opportunity to discuss it and decide how you all would like to um, field the request from MREMS. And it wasn't just a select board decision. It is a decision of the townspeople in whole at town meeting how you would like to proceed. Does that help, Dan? Um, hang, hang on. We need a microphone there. State your name again. Uh, Dan Brown. Thank you. I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. But. No. It's okay. more questions back here in the flannel shirt. Max. Sorry, Max. Now, Max Krauss, uh, I think we all agree that this is a tremendous service to the community, and the way the original um, 
uh, warning was written, it would appear it was for one year only anyway. But I agree with uh, Victoria's uh, amendment that we should do this this year and have the select board get into the picture. But I think to put it off is putting people's lives at risk and uh, turning down a very reasonable request from an excellent service that we all take advantage of. So I hope that everyone will vote yes for this year and look forward to the select board's uh, investigation for future years. Any other questions or discussion over here? Well, behind you, Dan, you've spoken twice, so. Uh, Chip Sorry. Malcolm, uh, even though I totally support the uh, ambulance, uh, I think that I, I, when I looked at this and I heard the presentation tonight, uh, this is more, it's not an endowment, but it is basically to increase part of their operation to replace equipment, a constant capital uh, change. To me, that's better done privately for a nonprofit. It would seem that as towns allocate monies in different ways, uh, whether it's to end of life or anything, uh, most of that's to mon maintain their services people-wise and, and in a different way, I think, than a buying equipment. And so whoever mentioned it, that the town has no control over the uh, very expensive piece of equipment as we would over a street sweeper or something that way. And uh, so I think I'm, I'm just uncomfortable that in fact this has come up now when in fact there is such a discrepancy with what, what they presented as to uh, different varies of amounts of support from towns across the state for their systems. And it just seems like either somebody wasn't on, uh, you know, on top of this or uh, I, I think it's too much at this point um, just for that. Thank you. Here in the front. Oh, sorry. Albert Perry. I fully support the motion and what's in the, uh, in the article. I think the people from MRMS have done a great job of explaining it. And if it oh, wasn't good enough for the Middlebury Select Board or soon enough for the Middlebury Select Board, I understand that. Uh, I un also understand that the uh, majority interpretation, if you want to call it that, that this is a one-year proposal to the voters. So I ask the voters tonight to fully support this and consider while you're, con while you're considering the motion, what would you do without MREMS in the future? And uh, what would you propose that they do other than what they're proposing tonight? So please support this. Right here in the front. Sweater. Hi, Allison Nyhart. Um, I would like to offer a, a friendly contrast to the gentleman in black over here because I, I think that it actually makes me uncomfortable to think that uh, a nonprofit providing such an important public service would have to rely on philanthropy in order to meet needs such as these. Um, since we don't have a publicly funded service otherwise that provides these important life-saving services, to me it seems entirely appropriate that these be town level allocations. Um, and I have no way of confirming the numbers that were presented to us, but if it is true that others are paying an average of over $25 per capita, and we've been paying 250, that's one tenth. Um, so it seems that we've actually been underfunding these services for quite a long time. Um, and this seems like a reasonable request. And I'd like to um, also support the idea, uh, if this isn't clearly a one-year request, that it, that it be so with uh, additional vetting by the select board in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. I see two hands in the back. Well, give it to Kevin. He's your friendly microphone man. Oh, thank you. Trying to go back and forth. <laughs> Sorry, Carrie. 
I have had State your name for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary Williams. Um, I want to make just a very short statement. I was a, I was a, a passenger in the ambulance about four months ago. I have never received such care, um, and I... I just can't imagine that we would not uh, support uh, the 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 MRMs. It, it was they were great. Thank you. So hang on a minute. I'm going to go over to Carrie, and then we'll go back to you. Uh, Mark Money, uh, I agree with everyone about the service they provide, but on a financial basis, this category is, uh, I think, more what uh, Chip Malkin mentioned. It's a donation by the town to services in the area. There's nothing, I think, with the other services that have uh, asked for funds that approaches this level. I think maybe the highest amount that the town has decided to uh, subsidize other services may be in the low 20,000 range down to, and it's really interesting, tonight, uh, another service asking for $5,000 has to have it voted by ballot tomorrow. So for 60 something thousand dollars for a town meeting to vote as a donation for one year may set a precedent for other agencies to look at Middlebury or substantial donations knowing that this one may pass. Again, I'm not questioning the service provided, but 60, a quadruple increase in one year is, uh, I just think, extraordinary. And that the select board should vet this before we approve it. Because the group said, they're not in financial difficulty. Hang on a second. Um, Heather Seely wants to answer and clarify, and then I'll get back to them. No, keep hold on to that microphone. Oh, sorry, I took it away from you, Heather. <laughs> just hands up all over. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, uh, clarify part of Mr. Mooney's statement in that um, the. Uh, nonprofits on voted by Australian ballot tomorrow are new ones that we have never before approved an appropriation for. So um, those services that have been on the budget for previous years and come for a request, you saw earlier in the budget presentation, um, typically I think um, with this request, we could have opted to put it in the budget, although it came late and it was a large amount and we didn't feel we had a lot of time to discuss it. So we chose to let the voters have the discussion here. But the ones on the ballot tomorrow are new ones that we have not given money to before. And our policy has always been to let the town vote on those by Australian ballot to add them to the budget and then they continue from there. Hi, Linda Horn. I'd like to call the question. Okay, so the question before you right now is for the amendment only, is to amend Article 4 to be for one year only. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I think the ayes have it, um, the ayes do have it, and the amendment goes through. So now we are considering Article 4 um, with the amendment to make it for one year only. And there was a hand in the middle that I lost track of who it was. There was one over there. If this person has given up, do you still want to talk? You're up. I... 
uh, Leave Herdman. Um, and I just want to say that. Can you say your name again, please? Leave Herdman. Thank you. Um, I, and I just want to say that uh, on first glance, not knowing a lot about this, the and the finance involved, the um, emergency services seems to be providing a similar service as the police department and that they need to be continuously running vehicles all the time because we want them there to save our life 24 seven and that their request is on par with that of the police department vehicle request. So it passes the smell test in my book and that it definitely deserves approval for this one year at least um, because I don't want to live in a town where the ambulances don't work. <laughs> Thank you. There was a hand over here in the back. Uh, George Tucker again. Um, so I guess I would prefer if the select board took a really hard look at this. Giving a one year lump sum uh, towards a budget that needs an awful lot more to actually do something with that money uh, doesn't seem to be a, a good use of the funds at this point in time. Health care is a very emotional uh, subject. And I think we need to look at this from a fiscal standpoint, uh, first and foremost and determine if this makes the most sense. And I'd say we turn it back to the select board and let the select board do their job. And um, we look at this next year. There's a green shirt over here that's been waiting a while. Hi, my name's Mary Chapman. And I can't believe we're talking about fiscal responsibility and health. I have a daughter that's 33. She was hit by a car on High Street the ambulance was there in a matter of 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Minutes. Saving my daughter's life. So this is not a budget issue. This is a responsibility issue. There's a hand right behind you, Kevin. Behind you. There you go. He's been waiting a while. I've got you next. Uh, Bruce Meacham. Is the money that you're asking for the increase the same for all the towns increase, 80%, 100%? That's correct. So it's an increase of a per cap appropriation. So per person, okay. 250 to $10. Okay, so every, say, Cornwall is going to pay the same amount that Middlebury is asking. That's exactly right. So in the front here in the green jacket, sorry, Jason, you're one more ahead of you. My name is John Cook. I just wanted to ask for clarification. On the slide, it said the ambulances will be replaced in 2026 and 2028. So if we approve this one-year increase, that will not approach. I'm sorry. You'd have to go back a slide to see prior replacements. This is talking. So in 2021, we're going to replace an ambulance that dates to 2009. It's going to be 12 years old at that point. Okay. Thank you. So, Carrie, did you have somebody? And then it's Jason, then you. Oh, that is you. Go ahead. Diane Lawson. I think that I would like to see it thrown back to the select board. The reason being, yes, we are talking about health care, and yes, we are talking about lives, but we're also talking about procedure. And everything that we do Every time we make a decision in our beloved town meeting, we set precedent. And when we do something right, it's incredibly important. And when we do something wrong, even for the right reasons, it's also incredibly important. And tonight, if we make a decision to contribute to a capital improvement fund, I think we have to consider if that's the right decision to make. I don't know that I've ever sat through a town meeting and given money to a charity's capital improvement fund before. Jason. Um, I. I'd like to reframe our thinking a little bit, or some of our thinking a little bit on these kinds of line items. Um, where some folks are characterizing this as a charitable donation, and I understand that characterization because this is a nonprofit. But uh, 
in reality, what we're doing as a town is we're outsourcing these services that we are not funding and pulling into our own budget. So they're necessary community services, and we've des decided as a town that we're going to fund them by paying contractors, essentially, for that work. So we have over oversight options available to us. If we want to control the frequency and the, the kind of, of replacement and the kind of equipment like we do with our police cruisers, then perhaps we should purchase the ambulance for our, by, by the town and make it available to the ambulance service. My guess is that that's a level of complexity that maybe we don't want as a town, and that perhaps we should trust this organization that's been serving us so well and so long to manage those costs using their expertise in the way, same way that we contract for lots of other services, whether they be legal counsel or otherwise, right? Um, the fact that these services are nonprofits is, to my mind, not a detriment to us as a town and shouldn't disqualify them from funding like any other contractor. To my mind, that makes them a better value. Um, so I would suggest that we maybe reframe our thinking a little bit on managing these kinds of costs and whether and how much we really want to take this on ourselves as a community versus having these excellent organizations do it for us. Hang on. Behind you, Max, there's one hand to a new hand. We're going to let that one. John Balparta. I have a question about the, um, what kind of oversight there might be over, uh, is it MREMS? Does yes. the select board get to see any kind of um, uh, a budget or some sort of um, financial statements? How, how do we, how do we, um, so, How do we ensure the funds are being spent appropriately is my question. Yeah, it, it's a fair question. Um, at their request, we provided the select board with a copy of our most recent audit. Um, the oversight is that uh, we have a volunteer board um, and we welcome participation from the board, whether it be from members of the select board or other members of the participating communities. Um, <laughs> Volunteerism is down, uh, both at the individual service level, uh, but at the board level as well. So um, the oversight is the board, and we look to add to that base of knowledge and expertise at every opportunity. I saw John Tenney's hand. Madam wait, wait, um, microphone. Thank you. Uh, Madam moderator, uh, with due respect to the Ambulance Association, but in recognition of the many questions and concerns we've heard this evening and the, the clear need for examining process and proper vetting by the select board, I move that we table this motion. Hmm, okay. Hang on a second. I gotta look that one up. Is there a second to that motion? I see one back there. By Farhad? All right, sorry. Hang on a second. Just want to make sure I do it correctly. All right, so under consideration, John, what, how did you word it again? You wanted to table the motion. They, thank you. So there is no debate anymore. We're just going to have a majority vote. So the question before you is to lay it on the table. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Oh. To tabling the main article, that's what we're debating right now. It's 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 it set failed. aside, and we if if it's going to come back, it will come back to a different town meeting. Sorry, I have it all in my head, but that doesn't really explain it to everybody else. 
Other questions on what we're about to do? Yes? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Carrie's running. I just want to make sure everybody knows what they're voting on. I'm not going to open up the discussion again. Yeah, uh, so is this meaning that... Uh, we would set this aside. Voting yes would set aside Article 4? Correct. Completely not the amendment. We're talking about Article we 4 already itself. Set, we already settled the amendment is attached to Article 4 at this point. Okay, so voting no would keep Article 4 alive? Or are Correct. voting... Correct. So voting no keeps, keeps Article it. 4 alive. Voting yes gets rid of Article 4. Correct. Thank you. Sorry for the not clarifying that too well. Is this a clarification question? Frank Winkler, so, so if we vote yes, we set the, uh, this aside. Correct. And uh, does that mean that it is uh, uh, dead for until next year? It's dead until if the select board wants to have another special town meeting, they may do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, a clarification question? It's a motion to table in order if its purpose is to delay consideration. Um, yes. Yes. It's not, it's, it's not what he said is his only purpose. So I didn't consider that to be the only purpose. One last question and then we're going to go. And it better be a clarification. Okay. <laughs> so, Tyler Ayers, can I offer an alternative? No, motion? it's not debatable. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. What's your name again? Tyler Ayers. Ayer Tyler Ayers. Okay. All right. So, the question before you is to lay Article, let me say it correct, Article 4 on the table. It is, do you want me to read it? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is um, decided by majority, not two-thirds. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say aye. aye. Oh, my. All right, so I'm going to want a show of hands. All in favor, please raise your hand. And nays? The nays have it. Okay. So we are continuing to debate Article 4. Back, it's Tyler, correct? As amended, thank you. So I'm, I'm new here, so thanks for uh, taking me on, uh, Tyler Ayers. I would like to offer an alternative possible amendment or solution, a motion, or whatever the right term is. Um, can I, I, I uh, move to say that uh, let's, uh, maybe I need to rephrase this, but let's, can we approve this budget and give the select board some time to do their diligence and if for, put, it, put this line item in the budget, include it, and if for some reason under their, uh, under their diligence discover some atrocity or <laughs> something that is, <laughs> so, something that really alarms them, seriously and honestly, that they have the ability to, to cut this out of the budget, but if nothing is found, to move forward as it is included as a line item. I would say that's out of order as warned. Darn. I know. It's very exciting, though. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> Nancy Morgan, I call a question. Thank okay, you. thank you. So the question has been called. Uh, Debate stops, and we are going to vote on. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to do right now. So what we're doing is we're voting on calling the question. If the calling the question means that we're ending debate, okay. So we're voting right now on ending debate for this article. Is that clear for everybody? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Okay, the eyes have it. We are ending debate on Article 4. Are you ready for the question? As amended, do you need me to read it? Yes? Okay. So I'm going to tell you where I've put it in. Shall the town of Middlebury vote to increase its appropriation for one year only for Middlebury Regional Emergency and Medical Services, MREMS, by 63720 excuse me, $63,720 from $21,240 to $84,960 to support MREM's mission to provide quality emergency medical services, including paramedic and heavy rescue service, emergency dispatch, and answering medical education and community outreach. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Article 4 is adopted. Thank you for your nice, support. Thank nice you. job, everybody. Article 5. Shall the voters of the town of Middlebury vote to collect taxes on real property for fiscal year 2020-2021 in two equal installments due in the treasurer's office on the 15th day of October 2020 and the 15th day of March 2021. There is no presenter, but if you have a question, we can get that answered for you. In the front here, we're going to make Carrie run all the way down again. <laughs> Steve Gross. I uh, remember last year when this came up and the, the uh, payments were made from traditionally, I think, three payments and reduced to two payments. And I asked the question, was this a one-year only uh, change? And the answer, was, I believe, last year was that it was for one year only. So I, w I wonder, on the one hand, why it's now being uh, uh, suggested for this additional year. And my concern is, uh, for some residents, it may be that... Uh, putting their tax uh, burden into two payments is a, a greater burden for them than if it was to be into three. So I'm concerned for some members of our community and wonder what the rationale is. Looks like Kathleen stepped up. So we extended the two payments per year this year to lessen traffic in the downtown during the main railroad bridge project. Our typical three periods were, our pre three payments were August 15th, uh, October 15th, and um, March 15th. So, so I, I understand that that's a, that's, that's a benefit on the one hand, but I, from my perspective, I think it would be outweighed for the uh, burden that it would place sure. on some people. So anyone that wants to make spread their payments over three installments can make an arrangement with the treasurer, and she can do automatic debits for those or receive payments in, in three installments. So with the construction being terminated after this coming year, would, would the idea be to, re, to return after uh, the, all the construction is done, two, three payments, or would this be more or less your plan for a permanent change? Don't have any plan going forward. Okay. Before I take other questions, as you're talking, I realize I forgot to take a motion and a second for this article. So I'd like to pause for a second. Is, would anyone like to make the motion? I will so move. Thank you, Anne. And I see Gary Baker. Are you willing to second, Gary? Thank you, Gary. Um, let's continue to discuss. Sorry about that. Um, question over here. My name's Maya Zimmerman, and I also really don't approve of this move at all. I think it was very difficult for people with people of limited means to make payments as high as some of the payments that we had to make in twice a year payments. I pay taxes also in Ferrisburg. I pay four a year. I pay, used to pay taxes in Virgenz and I paid four a year. And I think this is really a hardship on people. I'd like to ask what percentage of people drive into town to pay their taxes? Most people do electronic, they send checks. I can't imagine that there's that many people coming to pay their taxes and have to park. Over here. Uh, is Jackie Sullivan, our town treasurer here. 
Jackie Sullivan, town treasurer. About a third, I would guess, actually stop in the office to make the payments. That would be my guess. Can I just, sorry. I'd also like to just add that um, there's information that comes from the state that we don't receive until about September 15th. This year, we didn't have the number of revised bills that we had in the past, but in the past, we've had about 150 revised bills. So as you can imagine, by the time you've made one payment, and we need to recalculate everything. There's a fair amount of time that's spent. I really encourage anybody that's having a difficult time to step up and we can make payments, a payment plan. Over here. Uh, Chip Malcolm. I, I, you know, I don't really think it's, uh, last year when we voted to do it, it was because of the reappraisal and uh, the, the not having the data when the August payment would have been done. I, I think this minimized traffic is ridiculous, honestly. Uh, I am, will agree to go along with the two payments, but I agree with uh, Dr. Zimmerman and others that uh, I, I think the three payment system works much better across the board for people, albeit that we have flexibility in paying it when we wish to, but thank you. Here. John Barstow, yeah. I couldn't agree more with that statement. And uh, also that I thought we wanted to attract people downtown during this construction. <laughs> so I think we're at cross purposes here. Um, so please vote this down. Any other comments or discussion? You ready for the question? Oh, one more. Anne LaFiandra, um, I broke my own wildest hopes and filed my uh, income tax by the end of January this year and then proceeded to get several additional documents from entities that meant now an amended return needs to be made. So I hear Jackie Sullivan's point, which is great, we get the amounts all figured out and then guess what? Everything has to be changed. So I think we also need to consider that reality that official business doesn't always happen according to best laid plans. Although I think individual payment plans do sound like quite a nice service. But I hope we go back to three after this year if this is what is voted. Ross, down here. Thank you. Ross Conrad. Um, I was wondering if maybe Jackie could explain the consequences if this article gets voted down. What does that mean for a payment plan? So it's, you're saying if it's voted down, will we not do Without any plans? amendments, yes. If, if this gets voted down, what happens? What does, when do we make a payment? Who makes a payment? How, what? <laughs> Explain yourself, Jackie. <laughs> we haven't gone to that. We haven't talked about that. I don't know if it would go back. But I have to stress that the amount of time, especially in, you know, in August, that it takes to redo bills, the confusion with people to get more than one bill, they don't know which, are you talking about escrow companies, that we send out the information once and then we'll have to send it again and verify it again. I, I understand that. Personally, I'm not against this, but I hear there are some concerns about it. I just want to know, for, to answer that, those folks, if this gets voted down, then what is the payment plan? How, how do we make our payments and when do we make them? I There's think, nothing I, to guide that? I think or? we'd have to decide tonight. We'd have more we discussion. Would, I think we would have to we could do. Yeah, we could do it no sooner than August 15th. Okay provided that we have all the information from the state to get the tax rate. So Robin Shai, and then John. Uh, Robin Shai, uh, given what Ross said, thanks for bringing that up. So I'll make a motion that we, um, we amend Article 5 to have three equal installments uh, the way we have uh, in previous years. So it would be um, August, August 15th, November 15th, and March 15th. 
Hang on a second. Hang on. I'm writing down things. So August 15th looking. of 2020, November 15th of 2020, and March 15th of 2021. Now I can look for a second. <laughs> okay. Mr. Anderson? Sounds good. All right. So discussion on the amendment in the back. Linda Horn, and I'm getting tired. So how about we call the question on the amendment? Okay. So I'm going to, the amendment is to amend Article 5 to have three equal installments um, due on August 15th, 2020, November 15th, 2020, and March 15th, 2021. All She didn't call the question. Well, oh, I'm sorry. So we're going to vote in <laughs> Sorry. Um, calling the question. So um, either you vote yes, we're calling the question, we're going to end the amendment, or if you vote no, then we'll continue discussion of that. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. So the ayes have it. The question has been called. So the amendment goes through. No, we're we're going to vote on the amendment. Sorry. It makes a lot of sense in my head. Um, so I'm trying to think. So now we're going to vote on putting through three equal installments, August 15th, November 15th, and March 15th, 2021. Any question on that? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, so now we're back to the original article. Yes. No, we're good. But we did, we had to amend, we had to, she did the amendment first. Right, so it's amended to those dates. But they haven't voted on the main, the main thing. It's amended that you But that's... I'm good? Okay. I'm good? Okay. I, all right. Um, so Article 5 is adopted as amended. That's, it's been amended. It hasn't, that's what I was trying to tell you. The amendment was adopted, but the original motion has not been. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Support from the group. Okay, so the original motion as amended, I'm going to read it so we all know. Shall the voters of the town of Middlebury vote to collect taxes on real property for fiscal year 2020-2021 in three equal installments due in the treasurer's office on the 15th of October... 15th of August 2020, the 15th of November 2020, and the 15th of March 2021. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> the ayes have it. Article 5 has been adopted. I apologize for the confusion. <laughs> We've got a little debate going on up here. It's all friendly. So we're going to move on to Article 6. Shall the voters of the town of Middlebury vote pursuant to 24 VSA 2408A to authorize the select board to apply up to $1 million from the Cross Street Bridge Reserve Fund for the purpose of funding water system improvements for the court square area including the intersection of Main Street, North Pleasant Street, Route 7, Seymour Street, Court Street, Route 7, from Court Square to Cross Street, and Washington Street from Court Square to Seminary Street. What's your pleasure regarding Article 6? Thank you, John Tenney. Moved and seconded by Lindsay Fuentes-George. Thank you. And I'm going to call Heather, who's already on it, up by the podium. Go ahead, Heather. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, so, try to make this um, quick and move us along. Uh, so, for uh, fiscal year 2021, we're proposing to use one million from the Cross Street Bridge Refund Reserve Fund, excuse me, for the water system improvements. Um, the areas we're proposing uh, making repairs to uh, include. Um, Court Square uh, from Main Street, North Pleasant Street, Seymour Street area to Court Square. Uh, we refer, refer to that as 1A. Uh, Court Street, uh, Route 7, um, excuse me, from Court Square to Cross Street, down Court Street, Route 7, as 1B. And then the Washington Street, which is from Court Square to Seminary Street. If we use bonding as the sole funding source for this project, it would require a substantial water rate in, would require substantial water rate increases and limit the ability to address um, other repairs and upgrades in a timely manner. As an alternate solution, we're proposing a combination of funding the water capital budget with local option tax cross street bridge fund surplus um, as a way to tackle um, this priority repairs or these priority repairs. As many of you know, the Court Street, uh, Court Square, Washington Street area waterline has suffered numerous breaks in recent years, including several large breaks. Um, the total cost of those repairs uh, was in excess of $75,000 in 2018 and 2019. Um, those breaks have closed schools and businesses. So as a note to this, um, uh, VTrans has a class one paving project um, scheduled for the fall of 2021. We're currently uh, in the process of engineering um, phase 1B and 1A, um, 1A beginning uh, potentially in late summer of 2020. That would be this coming late summer, fall. And the estimated, um, the estimate right now for the all three phases is two and a half million. Uh, we're proposing one million from the fund reserve and then one and a half million from water system users. So the question, why would we use Cross Street Bridge uh, reserve funds to help fund this project rather than solely from rate payers? Uh, as you know, the Cross Street Bridge funds are made up of local, local option tax funds and everyone purchasing um, products in Middlebury, eating in Middlebury, um, paying that tax contributes to that fund. We all use the water, even myself, um, not on the system, my kids attend the school, we're using the restrooms in this facility tonight. Um, we all use and rely on the water. Many of the businesses in town we all work at, um, they require in need that water. Um, this helps um, spread the cost of these improvements out over the greater community um, and not just the water systems. It doesn't um, fall on the back of just the water users, or excuse me, the water rate payers. Um, this also reduces the cost of borrowing, saving interest on borrowing, and better uses our um, capital funds. So uh, funding sources. So for, um, as part of the water capital budget for fiscal year 20, we've included $300,000. For fiscal year 21, 455000 Fiscal year 22, 565,000, and then fiscal year uh, 23, 180,000. And then the local option tax, if approved, would be 1 million, which gets us the total of uh, 2.5 million. So I would just like to um, clarify something that can often be a little confusing. Uh, why would we ask you to approve a $2.5 million bond vote when we're not actually looking to bond for that much money? 
Um, it's come to our attention with the uh, State of Vermont Drinking Water State Revolving Fund where we might have the opportunity for grants and also some loan forgiveness or maybe even some lower interest loans that they look for a successful bond vote from the community as support for the project for you to be eligible for some of those um, grant opportunities. So this is a critical step in the process, even if we don't bond for this amount of money, but we see support from the community for the full amount of the project. Okay. Any questions for me? Any questions for Heather in the back? Hand up first. Would any work any work be done uh, on any part of this? Oh, wait, your name for the record, Sorry. please. Thomas Williams, Thank Middlebury. You. Any work be started or done before the ending of the tunnel project? Right now, the plan is uh, that the work would start after the end of the um, rail bridge project closures. And right now, the proposal is that most of the work would actually be done at night uh, and not during the day. Uh, less traffic, safer for construction workers, um, but we are still evaluating and determining how that looks. In the front here. Microphone's coming. Frank Winkler, uh, you mentioned uh, a class one paving project in 2021. Could you explain a little bit more about what uh, uh, what's being paved and the um, implications of that for, for this uh, water project? Sure. So um, the class one roads in the town of Middlebury that the state will repay for us are basically from the town line on Route 30 uh, around the roundabout over Cross Street Bridge um, to the town line on North Pleasant Street. Um, in addition, from the town line on Route 7, um, also from the town line on, where's Dan? from the town line on 125 or from the college. He'll have to clarify that one. But basically the, the class one roads in the town of Middlebury are the ones in basically our town center and the state contracts to pave those projects, to do the paving of those roads for us. Yes, just to clarify, Route 125 uh, down the hill from the college all the way into town, including College Street would be done also and Academy Street. And so the reason why this, uh, it's important for us to get this work done prior to that project is we will be digging in areas that they will be repaving. And ideally, we would not repave the roads and then dig them up again. <laughs> Blue check shirt. Bruce Meacham, I have a few questions. We're concerned about the water, but what is the shape of our other utilities? So, meaning wastewater, sewer mains, drainage structures. If they're going to come through and do these class ones and we repair what we need to for water, but we have a sewer main break, then we're in the same boat we are if we don't do the water. So that's a good question. Um, most of the time when we do these water line repairs, we are also looking at um, our stormwater situation, our sewer situation, and trying to repair all of those services at the same time before we repave the road. Um, I think this time we're a little in a hurry to get this done, given the schedule of the paving. Uh, so we, I don't know, Dan, if you want to add to the condition of the, <coughs> excuse me, the services, the storms, um, stormwater, wastewater, services in those areas? Sure. Um, don't see any issues with sanitary sewer. There will be some storm sewer, uh, small repairs on Court Street. Some of those will be town crew. But when they talk about a class one paving process, the state has an engineer that do, does all the surveying. They take a look at all the storm sewer, 
So from everything from about 15 inches below grade to surface grade, those were adjusted. Um, the highway department has already looked at um, Court Street. Some of the uh, uh, piping is, is concrete. It was done many years ago, still in good shape. You'll notice uh, the mess we had at, uh, at the open high school out here uh, for a few months. Um, that was on the town dollar to pay for that. Um, result of highway, taking a look at it, we had a contractor fix that. So we fixed some of those big um, storm sewer projects um, before in anticipation of this class one paving. Um, uh, nothing really on College Street. That was all done some years ago. Um, pretty good shape on North Pleasant Street too. So don't expect anything. Um, is there any, before I let you talk again, is there somebody else who wants to comment? I see one in the back, sorry. We'll get back to you. Ellen Cronin, uh, was, can you share with us the rationale of the um, financing being 40-60, the split in terms of uh, uh, where you're gonna take the funds from? Hang on one second. Ellen, what's your last name again? Cronin. Thank you. Welcome. So typically most of the capital um, water system upgrades that we do are um, entirely funded by the water uh, fund, which is the revenue comes from the rate payers. In this particular case, we are upgrading uh, some of the main infrastructure, um, the main pipes that distribute to the rest of the town and really benefit the entire town, What this section that we're talking about. Um, so in our discussions in trying to keep um, rates as reasonable as we can for ratepayers and um, spread the cost around the greater community, this is what we proposed. Can I say specifically how we came up with 6040? No, I think it's maybe what we felt comfortable taking from the Cross Street Reserve Fund and, um, and what we felt we could ask ratepayers to, to um, come up with. Before I go back to Mr. Meekum, is there anybody else who would like to speak on this article? I got two hands here. You can, there we go. Thanks, Adam Franco. Um, so I think this is generally a great project. My one question is, uh, is this portion of the water system the main one that needs to be repaired that is problematically aging or are there other segments of our water mains that are uh, similarly antiquated and will be in need of replacement in the future? How much time would you like to spend? <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> okay um, so we went through a process um, about a year ago where we did, um, we hired a consultant to do a hydrological study of our water system. And we had, uh, and I say we, I'm talking about the infrastructure committee, had identified um, priority projects uh, that we thought were necessary to tackle. Um, as a part of that uh, hydrological, I'm probably not saying that right, that, that water study, <laughs> um, we, were, we were supported in our, um, in our priority projects. And this one was at the top, you know, this, these, th um, there are three phases, but it's really one project. We're just breaking it down into seasons, basically. We do have a lot of other work to do. Um, we do have other priority projects on our top three, top five list um, that we will have to tackle going forward. Yes. So in the middle, the hat. Hi, Tyler Ayers. Uh, can you just speak to how will this will affect ratepayers going forward? Just a general sense. I don't know if you can give like an average increase or, or, or just speak to that a bit. So I can't right now because the project hasn't gone out to bid and I don't have final numbers. I only have estimates. And I also don't know what the voters are going to approve. Um, and so what we need to do if the voters approve this uh, using reserve funds to fund a million of this, then that changes the funding strategy, right? The next stage is that we uh, go into bid. Dan, do we have this out to bid yet? Or 
I'm putting him on the spot. Thursday. Is when they're due or when it goes Go, out? Goes out to bid Thursday. It goes out to bid on Thursday. Bids, so bids will be due end of March. So by you know end of April, we'll have a sense, and that's first for phases A and B, I believe, right, Dan? So the first two sections, we'll have a sense of where the numbers are going to come in, um, how close we are to our estimate. Um, we'll know what the voters have approved, and we'll be able to say, you know, this is how much we have to come up with, this is what the voters have said, and then we'll be able to sit down and say, this is what we're going to have to ask rate pairs um, to come up with. And as I get into the next article, I can talk about, you know, um, the bonding and the seven years and the money we'll save on interest, too. Uh, Ross Conrad. So just to clarify, uh, before we'll know what it really is going to cost to ratepayers and how much is going to come out of the Cross Street Bridge Fund, we would be we would have to approve this, and then there's the possibility that state and federal money could lower that so that we won't be paying anywhere what's being proposed. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't go so far to say anywhere. <laughs> um, we're going to have to come up with some money towards this. We're not. We're not going to be able to get a million five from the state. But there, there probably is some opportunity. I think that Dan has, you know, recently identified. If we have community support by a full bond vote, that we can then explore with the state revolving loan fund for drinking water. And so, thank you, Ross, for bringing that up because I didn't mention that before. You know. If the voters support the project, our bids come in in April, we know how much we can put from the Cross Street Bridge Fund, we can explore options with the state, and then the last piece will be identifying what we need to ask ratepayers for to cover the balance. Let's go back to Mr. Meekham. Bruce Meacham, I just want to get back to the utilities um, again. Have we cameraed our wastewater lines or anything? It just concerns me that the state of Vermont's going to come through and do all this class one 15 inches and up, and we're going to come through and do a million and a half on our water, and then two years later we're going to turn around and try to get some more money to redo our other utilities that need to be done again. And then everything the state has just done is we have to pay for again. So I think what Dan was trying to say is that the areas that we're working in for these particular water are other services in the area, our stormwater and our wastewater are in good shape. That's not to say that there aren't other areas that need attention. But I think in these particular areas, the other services are in good shape. Wait, wait, you need a microphone? a microphone? Kevin, where are you? <laughs> Sorry, can you start over again? Sure. So our goal here is to get these water upgrades completed before the pavement comes through, um, as because water is the deepest, of course. So what happens, is, what is the shape of the wastewater as well? I mean, if we're going to be in this area, so, has it been camered to the conditions? Because uh, we don't know. So Dan, you did just say that these the wastewater and the stormwater have been reviewed and evaluated by Department of Public Works and they're in good condition and in not need of repair as part of this project, correct? Bob Wells, are you in the room? No, okay. I have not heard anything from Bob Wells as any issues and Bob's well aware of the project. So I think sanitary wise, we're not expecting anything. Storm sewer we already talked about. So just as a reminder for those affected, um, we did a big wastewater um, construction project this past year where we did some big upgrades. Um, Washington Street, um, oh, what's the name of that road that goes the other way? Thank you, Seminary. Um, we did, that was a $1.5 million project. That was the pump station upgrade. And all that. Pump, pump, pump station, but there were also some line upgrades too, right? Yeah. $1.3 million pump station improvement. Any other questions? One more in the back. Off to your left. Call a question, please. Tim Williams. Okay. And we're going to vote on calling the question. So, calling the question ends debate. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Okay. So we're going to go back. Um, the ayes have it. Um, so we're going to go back to Article 6, as warned. And the motion is on ad adopting art Article 6. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, and Article 6 is adopted. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. We're going to move on to Article 7, which is to transact other business proper to be done. We have a couple presentations, and then we'll get into more information from the floor. And we're calling up um, Heather. You're already here, right? Sure you want to go back on? Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you want me to read the article at all? The We're not going to be voting on it here. This is um, the articles that will be voted by Australian ballot tomorrow. Happy to do that. It's um, Article 8 is shall general obligation bonds or notes for the town of Middlebury in an amount not to exceed $2,500,000 subject to reduction from available alternative sources of funding be issued for the purpose of financing construction of water system transmission and distribution improvements related to the court square area including the intersection of main street north pleasant street route 7 seymour street court street route 7 from court square to cross street and washington street from court square to seminary street Project the estimate cost of such improvements being two million five hundred thousand dollars. Take it away, Heather. Thank you, Madam Moderator. So we talked about this a little bit just a few minutes ago. Um, I think it's clear what we're asking you to do. So I won't spend a lot more time talking about it, other than to just say um, we're not necessarily asking you to allow us to bond for this amount of money. We're asking you to show your support for the project by approving the bond, and then we will reduce how much we borrow, um, you know, with what you just approved, and also any opportunities we can identify with the uh, state drinking water, uh, re the revolving loan fund. And again, we're not voting on this this evening, but this is your opportunity to ask questions. So just quickly on the screen, the map. Um, the green is what I was identifying as 1A, which we're tentatively proposing for the fall of 2020. Um, yeah, I have that right, right? <laughs> yeah, and the yellow is um, Court Square to Cross Street, which, would, which we're calling 1B, which would uh, happen in the spring of 2021. And then the blue is Washington Street to Seminary Street which right now we don't have a firm date on. Does anyone have any questions? Down here in the front. Your microphone is coming. All right, Frank Winkler again. Uh, this does not uh, directly address uh, this project, but it does address infrastructure in general. And I would submit that there are few things that would make a greater difference in Middlebury than to put the electric and, and all the utility lines underground in the village area. Now, it sounds as if the state is going to be coming through and paving most of the of the roads through the village area in 2021 if we're going to do this ever or within the next several years this would seem to be the logical time to do it and so i don't know uh what the procedure would be to accomplish that it's certainly not going to be by uh you know presenting a motion here at town meeting we uh once upon a time, perhaps one could do that sort of thing, but no longer. Uh, so, but I would uh, certainly encourage the select board to strongly consider trying to accomplish that, and it will make our town enormously better. And if you want an example, drive 18 miles south to Brandon, uh, which recently put 
their utility lines in the downtown area all underground and it the town looks enormously better thank you <laughs> any other so, questions whoops sorry i would just say we can do anything you'd like to do as long as you would like to fund it <laughs> so oops <laughs> i i'm I am all in favor of that. I just struggle with providing the voters a balanced, reasonable budget every year and trying to weigh our priority projects. And I, I would say that might be a goal for the next time the state comes through to pave the roads. Because um, well, it would take sorry. a considerable feat of engineering to, to get that ready for this one. Sorry, Heather. Ross? Uh, yeah, Ross Conrad. I would just also suggest that putting our utilities underground will make the utilities more resilient in the face of extreme weather events, and it should definitely be something the town should be looking at, if not now, definitely in the future. Thank you. So noted, and we'll make sure it's on an agenda and schedule for our infrastructure committee. Anything else for Heather? All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to invite up uh, Select Board Chair Brian Carpenter and uh, Lynn, Select Board Member Lindsay Fuentes George. They, they are going to, I'm sorry? Oh, not talking to me. Um, do you want me to read Article 9 for you? Or do you want to just dive into explanation? I I think I can dive into the explanation. I sort of want to save the time. <laughs> I, I missed an opportunity to thank all of our staff uh, while well, everyone was here. I see everybody, or at least half of our crowd, ducked out after the action items uh, were done. But I, I would like to take this opportunity while I have the mic to thank our town manager, Kathleen Ramsey, and her entire senior staff that is so professional and brings you a budget every year that gets it continues to improve the, the services and condition of our town while not raising taxes. So I thank you for all the work you do. <laughs> and part of that is this very creative financing package that we're bringing to you. And I wrote an article for the Addison Independent and John Flowers did a very nice job of covering what we're trying to bring to you. Um, on this Article 9 bond vote, it's a flood resiliency bond vote, it's for the work that we've been trying to get done in East Middlebury to make East Middlebury uh, more flood resilient. And it's a $2 million uh, group of improvements in the village of East Middlebury. Those improvements include repairing the existing flood wall that is damaged and extending that flood wall 150 50 feet downstream. The total cost of that work is a million, estimated to be a million dollars. The next is armoring sections of the Aussie road berm, and that's estimated to be $800,000. And finally, removing some sediment from chute entrances in the top of the large bars and that's estimated to be $200,000. So the total cost would be $2 million. Currently, East Middlebury is vulnerable to flood damages from erosion and inundation. The East Middlebury Flood Resiliency Project will repair existing berms and flood walls and remove sediment that has built up since Tropical Storm Irene. The project will also allow for long-term management of sediment in the river corridor to decrease the risk of future flooding. The project will reduce the potential for flooding in East Middlebury Village, protecting state and local infrastructure, including bridges, roads, and private residences and businesses. While the bond is for $2 million, we're actually only looking at a local match of 500,000, but we have to bond for the full amount and then Federal Emergency Management Agency will pay us back 1.5 million. We will also look to tap state clean water funds to help reduce our local share. 
So the actual amount to be borrowed will be reduced by those federal and potentially state grant funding. I guess I'm done. <laughs> We're also proposing that the debt service for the project will be offset by the local option tax receipts. Using the local option, local option tax receipts minimizes the impact on the tax rate. That allows us to do a borrowing term of seven year bond, which will also reduce the interest on that by $105,000 versus a 20 year bond. And that is the way we have the budget right now proposed to you, is with the funding to do all of this. So this will not impact your tax rate from what you saw earlier. Are there questions on this project? Any questions for Brian right here? Thank you, Adam Franco. Uh, so after Irene, I remember the town was uh, under scrutiny by one of the state agencies for having removed sediment from the riverbed in the where the river is trying to spread out and do flooding is uh, this project tying in or how is this project tying in with those sort of natural river meandering that um, this or is it continuing to channelize um, the river flow in a way that will continue to need to be maintained no, actually, uh, is Amy Sheldon still with us? She left? Oh, Amy. So <laughs> Amy's our water, uh, uh, our, our consultant on this project. But uh, it, it's a little different than, than what we did then. Uh, and we've gone back in and, and created the fish habitat since that time. Uh, and it's more of uh, shoring up the shoulders that are there. And uh, so I think Dan may be able to give a little bit more specifics. He's also involved in this project. Uh, one of the reasons FEMA to this day tells us they're going to be involved with this is that uh, with Amy's help, we looked at how much debris, in other words, stones and rocks, was going to end up in the river over a period of time. And they wanted guarantees from the town that we would do uh, routine maintenance, although it might be years in between these maintenance events. This is a con so some of this is considered a maintenance event. And so FEMA wanted guarantees that we would do that. The board had to adopt a policy that we, we would be involved. So one of these steps is to take some of the, the, the rocks and debris um, out of the river at uh, predetermined elevations. That's just one, one part of the three that Brian just talked about. Any other questions for Brian? So I hope you'll support our bond vote tomorrow. Thank you. So Lindsay, I'm going to call Lindsay Fuentes George up to talk about Article 10. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is the uh, adaptive reuse project for the um, police department. Can we go back to the... Um, so you see the police department here, the building at the top. Down and to the left is um, the former, um, what is it, sand filter building. Uh, then you see the impound lot, and then all the way to the side you see um, the, control, the former control building from the wastewater treatment plant just so you know what, which buildings we're talking about. We can go now. <laughs> All right, so this is a bond vote for um, $850,000 for rehabilit rehabilitating the former wastewater treatment facility buildings for use by the police department. Uh, the former wastewater treatment um, facilities moved in 2000 from their previous location on Lucius Shaw to where they are now. Um, and more or less the, the buildings have just been there. Uh, nothing's really been done to them in that amount of time. So you can see the condition. Um, you, you can't, we don't have a picture of the interior, but it looks a lot like a, like a gritty crime scene or something. <laughs> 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 um, 
uh, we can go to, that. yeah. So um, the police department moved to Lucia Shaw in 2004, and they have actually been utilizing these buildings since then, um, but they're, they're really um, not suited for the purpose anymore, <laughs> if they ever were. Um, so we're looking to we're looking to really provide the the police department with some much needed space for storage, um, and for their equipment and for the um, the town's investment in in uh, our cruisers and other equipment. Um, so there are sort of two parts. One part is is really um, the the finishing up of decommissioning the buildings so that um, that. Funding is coming from the wastewater department, um, and it has already gone out to bid. So those are those the big round tanks that you see. That's sort of um, getting rid of those, so they're not just big holes in the ground. Um, and so yeah, this will be um, this will be a bond boat. It'll be on it'll it'll be on Australian ballot tomorrow. And this is what the this is what the police department needs. Um, they really need a cruiser garage. If you if you saw the former sand filter building, it's sort of long. We'll show you another picture, but they have been using it, but it's very inadequate for their purposes. They need storage space, um, things that are confiscated or things that are being used in an investigation. They have to store those things somewhere. Um, hazardous materials, explosive materials. Um, you know, you don't want those things in buildings with people or with um, valuable equipment, so we need somewhere to put those things. And then along with this project is a tiny, a tiny portion of it is going to be addressing heat loss in the meeting room. The Middlebury Energy Committee did an audit of the police department, and one of the um, projects that was determined to be needed was um, infilling some windows. We'll, there'll be a picture later on, but... Um, to make the build, to make that room more usable, um, and to have it stop uh, wasting energy, basically. Um, we did consider um, just sort of raising everything and starting over, but the buildings really do have value; they're very solid, um, and so it seemed like it was going to be more of an expense for the town, and also, you know, adding to a landfill. So we decided to salvage what we could. So this is the sand filter building. You can see that there are vehicles in it, um, but it's a long building and the, and the garage door is on the end. So in order to utilize this building, they have to stack cars in, which is for emergency vehicle purposes is, is not helpful at all. Um, so we're looking to reconfigure that. Um, and the roof will be replaced and new doors will go on so that there'll be five bays for five cruisers. And I think if you, yeah, keep going. Um, there you can see a schematic of what it'll look like. So there'll be five individual bays. The roof will um, the roof will slope toward the back, eliminating the need to sort of shovel out the cruisers. Um, yeah, and and they'll be much more available when when needed. Uh, this is the former control building. Um, it's in pretty good shape, but the roof is leaking, and so we're looking to. Um, uh, replace the roofing membrane and some insulation, uh, you know, uh, insulating the interior walls, cleaning and repainting the interior. Um, and then uh, there are, you can see the three bays in the middle, um, the middle picture, and one of those will be, um, will drop down the entryway so that the command, so that the mobile command unit, uh, <laughs> is that the right term? Mobile command unit. <laughs> Um, can actually fit through the doors adequately. They can squeeze it in now, but it's um, it's really not a big enough opening for that. So that way they can get um, not only that, but um, if if the um, if there is an accident or if you know other other uh, vehicles that need to go in there um, can fit properly. So we can keep going. And here's the schematic for that. And you can see in the bottom right corner where we'll be dropping down um, that one bay all the way to the side to fit larger vehicles in there. Um, and then uh, finally, these are um, the brick building on the bottom for hazardous storage already exists. It's got some piping in it that we'll need to remove. Um, and then the top storage magazine is really like a prefabricated 
um, something we would purchase that's prefabricated, we would just need to put down um, a concrete pad for it to sit on. And again, this is to keep hazardous or explosive materials away from people and away from our equipment. Um, and then the final portion of the project, which was um, initiated by the Middlebury Energy Committee following an audit, is to infill these large windows. The windows are unfortunately um, cold in winter and hot in summer. <laughs> Um, and it kind of renders the room unusable, and it also wastes a lot of energy. It was one of it was one of the um, areas that the energy audit determined was was uh, wasting energy in that building. So they'll be infilled, um, and we decided to add it to this uh, project because that way there's equipment already on on site, and it, there's some savings there potentially. Um, so this is the total cost, um, the construction cost of $304,403. That includes design cost of $65,336 and then owner's cost, which is $43,237. So for a total of just under $850,000. Questions for Lindsay? Front. Steve Gross, I was wondering if these plans, and they look like they're thoroughly necessary and quite logical, uh, also was there consideration given though to uh, the possibility of a solar panel or uh, uh, so that, you know, the town could be modeling what we would like to see elsewhere? Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, solar panels aren't part of this project, but we have um, spoken with the um, engineer and the main control building potentially could um, could support them. So it's something that we could add later. Question in the back. Hi, Dave Solderman. Um, so uh, this the second year now that we've been um, talking about using the local option tax surplus for infrastructure projects and then been asked to approve projects that have nothing to do with infrastructure with that money. Look, the police department is getting 20% of the budget plus the other $80,000 that we approved earlier today. Um, this is not infrastructure. This is police management. This should be in the police budget. We should not be using our limited infrastructure money when we have so many infrastructure needs for non-infrastructure projects. And I urge my fellow Middlebarians to vote no on this tomorrow. Any other questions or comments? Heather has something. Oh, sorry, Heather, couldn't see you. So I have to disagree a little bit on um, Mr. Silverman's comment. Um, we are um, needing to complete the decommissioning of the original old wastewater treatment uh, facility. And we could choose, as Lindsay pointed out, to um, demolish these buildings and level the site for some other purpose. But as Lindsay stated, um, these buildings do have some value, and the police department de does need some additional space. And um, I do believe that it is part of our infrastructure. It is part of our town buildings. It is part of um, our what we are required as townspeople to take care of and maintain. And we're trying to do a good job of uh, reusing resources that have value. Um, and I do think it's a good use of the local option tax to, um, to take good care of what we have there. Max? Frank, my card. I'm sorry. Uh, first, uh, uh, one small question. Uh, the $43,000 of owner's costs I thought the town was the, uh, uh, the owner and the whole thing is our cost. 
So I'm not exactly sure why, why they broke things down that way, but those are things like fixtures inside the building, um, utilities that will need to be used while the construction is going on. It's like miscellaneous other things. All right, That's somebody can call is. it miscellaneous, perhaps. Yes. But at, at any rate, my, my real question is, uh, do you have an estimate of the total square footage uh, of the space to be renovated uh, oh. or, or <laughs> rehabilitated for reuse? Great time to stretch if you want to. Uh, the cruiser garage is 1,730 feet. The storage building is 3,700 feet and 1,800 square feet, or 18 square feet for the explosive storage building. So you're about 50, almost 5,500 square feet total. Wait for the microphone, please. So in round numbers, it's going to be something like $150 per square foot. Did I do that right? I haven't done the math. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that sounds probably uh, reasonable. Any other questions? Chief Hanley? This is not a new project. Uh, when the police station was designed in 2003, there was virtually no storage put into the building. The intent was to use existing buildings on site and reuse them, even though we knew there was going to be some cost. Uh, this has been delayed now for 17 years, and uh, the building has deteriorated since. The roof leaks badly. There's some sort of stuff that comes out of the roof, and it stains everything on the floor. Uh, so we stopped using the building for a lot of storage and have found other not-so-good alternatives. Uh, the issues of uh, some of the devices we come across explosive devices, uh, ammunition that's old, people get rid of, they drop all kinds of stuff off. There was blasting caps we come across. Uh, we don't have a place to put them. Uh, typically, we would take them out and just blow them up someplace. That's not really a, an ideal way to deal with it. They should, be, should go to the state EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Uh, we get a lot of other things. That garage has been used for everything from a temporary morgue to an airplane crash to uh, we store federal vehicles in there when they're doing dignitary protection. It's, we use it for training. It's just used for a lot of things. And uh, we had a program for that building way back in 2002 because we've been using that building since the wastewater plant left in 94. So we've actually been using that building and watch it fall apart. And so this is just a culmination of many years of looking and trying to figure out how we're going to get funding to take care of this building. This, none of this is new storage. This is not something we came up with in the last week. It's stuff that we've been using now for 25 years, 26 years. So that's what this project is about. Brian? I, I'd just like to reiterate what Chief said. This isn't anything new. And like Frank said, it's actually $130 per square foot. And if you're doing new construction right now, you'd be really skimping to do it for anything close to $200 per square foot. It's more, going to be more like $250 per square foot. So when you look at the cost on top of that of decommissioning these buildings and, and demolishing them, filling it in, we would probably be well over $300 per square foot. So it's a value for the community, it's a need for the community, and I would ask you to support this bond vote as well. Anything else? Okay. Hearing nothing? Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So I'm going to invite um, Turning Point staff members Stacy Jones and Justin Bouchard to come up and talk about Article 11. You on your own, Stacy? I was on my own. All right. Uh, Justin is uh, in Lincoln this evening because our 
board member uh, who was going to go to Lincoln was ill. Um, my son is also homesick with the flu. I'm carrying sanitizer in my pocket and I promise I won't touch things. Um, so I'm here today from the, the Turning Point Center of Addison County. Uh, you'll forgive me if I read. I'm not a great public speaker. Uh, uh, the Turning Point Center of Addison County is on Creek Road right next to the Recreation Center. Um, and it's a part of a system of peer recovery centers in the state of Vermont. There are 11 additional centers in the state of Vermont. Um, Turning Point Center of Addison County's recovery support services help people to rebuild their lives and become productive and engaged members of society. Um, volunteers and staff provide peer support, evidence-based services, educational programs, and recovery training um, in a safe and supportive environment. The center is staffed by trained volunteers and, um, and staff who uh, have a dedicated interest in, um, in helping people recover. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a peer support organization, so uh, all of the uh, staff and or volunteers are um, either people in recovery or um, they're people who have a loved one, a friend or family member in recovery, um, or who have an otherwise vested interest in um, learning more about recovery services. Um, where am I? Uh, so funding uh, for Turning Point Center is an investment in reducing incarceration, recidivism, and other social expenses. You heard a comment earlier um, from Dave and, and then from Tom um, about some of the partnerships that Turning Point Center is, is working toward uh, to provide additional services in the community. Um, I have a whole lot here on this page. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, just um, some numbers from 2019. Um, we had uh, 10,538 uh, guest sign-ins over the course of 2019. Um, 7,596 people attended uh, 682 peer support meetings hosted at our center. Um, we distributed 236 doses of Narcan, uh, that's uh, naloxone, it's an opioid re uh, reversal, opioid overdose reversal drug um, intended for the community members to save other community members' lives. Um, and we had a cumulative uh, 1,222 uh, hours donated by our dedicated volunteers. Um, there's more information there, but I'm going to let you all have questions and hope I can answer them. Any questions for Stacy? You're in the green. Hi, Mary Chapman. Huge supporter of Turning Point. I've been in recovery for 23 years. And this is exactly what we need in this community. I know what it's done for Burlington and I know what it's done for Rutland because I helped start the one in Rutland. And we have such a huge epidemic with addiction. This really needs to be supported in this town. If you really care about people, lift them up. Support Turning Point, thanks. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, CVOEO staff member Jeanette Guy Carey. Did I say your name correctly? Oh, thank you. I know I'm last. I'm going to say this as quick as I can and still have you understand what I'm saying. Um, CVOEO has been here in Addison County and served the residents of Middlebury since 1965. Our services include a food shelf, fuel assistance for low-income families and seniors, and housing assistance and advocacy. Additional programs we provide that are unique to our agency include Head Start, which has 13 licensed providers right here in Middlebury. Weatherization, which provides zero-cost energy audits and energy-efficient improvements 
to households with incomes up to 350% over federal poverty, tax preparation and renter's rebate assistance, farm to family coupons, the mobile home program, which helps mobile home park residents improve their living conditions and protect their housing rights, financial counseling, and lastly, a micro business development program to help individuals connect to resources to start their own small businesses. In 2018, as federal and state funding continued to be cut, CVOEO began petitioning the towns we serve for funding for our programs. In 2019, we were successful in petitioning Ripton, Weybridge, and Cornwall. This year, we were able to obtain the required signatures on our Middlebury petition to be on your town warning to request funding. We respectfully request that the residents of Middlebury support our request for $5,000 to assist us in continuing to provide services to those in need. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Any questions for Jeanette? This is really anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you came, though. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's about it. Okay. <laughs> Article 13 is to elect officers as required by the Middlebury Town Charter. Um, and usually this is a moment where we let candidates um, stand up and say a few words. Um, before we do that, I just want to make a quick note um, for Liz LeBeau has been um, doing the sound for us this evening on her own time. And um, at the mics are Kevin Newton and Carrie Duquette Hoffman, who have been running back and forth in the aisles. So are there... <laughs> guys did a good job. So are there any candidates for office who would like to stand and say a few words over here? Dan? For the few left here tonight, um, I am Dan Brown. My wife, Michelle, and I uh, have owned the Swift House Inn and Jessica's Restaur Restaurant in town for the last 16 years, and I'm seeking a seat on the select board. Thank you. Anyone else? Here you go. Your microphone is coming. Hi, I'm Victoria Jetty. Um, and I've been on the Middlebury uh, ACSD board since its inception, um, and I'm running for re-election, uh, and I would appreciate your vote. I've got three kids in three schools, uh, and I am the chair of the facilities committee, as well as on the finance committee. Uh, we're at a really critical time in our evolution as a learning community, um, and I and the other incumbents have been have spent the last few years really studying what makes our schools great uh, and what challenges we face. Um, I support transparency and I also support fiscal responsibility uh, and I would appreciate your vote. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Oh. Hello, um, I'm Mary Gill. I'm also running for a second term on the ACSD school board. And um, I've had many years' experience working in schools and um, really support the hard work our teachers and our administration do to make us make this quality uh, school district. And as, as Victoria said, we are in a process of really trying to grapple with the decreased uh, enrollment and how to continue quality education with decreased funding. So I, I'm asking for your vote as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Brian? So I'm Brian Carpenter, and I'm running again for select board. I appreciate your vote uh, to continue to serve this lovely community, and I hope everybody does get out and vote tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Kristen Gardner. Um, I am running for Middlebury School Board, Aston Central School District. And um, I am new to this process, but I have lived in Shoreham and in Middlebury, and I'm hoping to have more conversation back and forth to have maybe a district town meeting where we can have these conversations. Because our budget meeting with um, 
was that for the district, but there wasn't a whole lot of people from Middlebury. Um, it felt, um, it was packed, but not with the, not with everybody. And I don't think people really knew that that was the place and time to have these discussions about the school. Because three years ago when we separated, it was kind of our budget meetings one with the school, and then you have the town meeting, which is our town information. So I think that we need to find a way to kind of bridge that so people felt heard so that their, their processing can happen um, as we have these conversations together and have the answers to our questions. So get out and vote tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you a Middlebury resident? I'm not. Okay. I'm on the ballot for Middlebury, though. She's on the ballot. That's what I wanted to ask. Go ahead. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> uh, Just. So my name is Jen Newseater. I do live in Salisbury. Um, I've been on the ACSD school board for the past four years. I've been the chair of the Planning and Engagement Committee as part of my role on the board. Um, because you are in, in Middlebury and it's an ACSD board, we vote at large, and you do have the opportunity to vote for me tomorrow. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to give a face to the name that you'll be able to vote for tomorrow. Thanks so much. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Hi, Ann Webster, and I'll be on the ballot again tomorrow for the Office of Town Clerk, and I've just finished 18 years with the town in that position, and so running unopposed, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to, to get in, but um, so I just wanted to say that it's, it's definitely a pleasure working for this town, and I have certainly felt very supported by the town members for many, many years. Thank you. And I guess I'll say a few words too. I have a couple hours of experience, but I'm also running unopposed. So um, I appreciate your vote, and I promise next year will be a little faster. Um, anyone else? I would like to invite Laura Assermly to come and talk about our favorite town meeting poll. So is there anyone out there who is attending their first town meeting in Middlebury, in Middlebury? So a special welcome Yay. and thank you to you. Um, and, and we really appreciate those that have hung in there. And I don't want you to forget that we do have a Middlebury town meeting poll that you can complete as you um, vote tomorrow. Um, you can take one home and bring it back if you want. They're on the way out. And it's your opportunity to really give us feedback on how we conduct our town meeting. And in fact, we've refined it as a result of your responses to previous polls. So it's, it's a great opportunity to let us know what you're thinking about not only town meeting, but our services and, um, and parking and, um, and other things on your mind. So thanks for completing that. And, and letting us know how we're doing. Thank you, Laura. I will, is there any other business people would like to conduct? Because I would love to entertain a motion to adjourn. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> how about Jason Duquette Hoffman, seconded by Adam Franco? All in favor of adjourning our meeting? Yay, meeting is adjourned. No, I'm not discussing anything else. <laughs>